I'd like to call to order the Monday, February 14th, regular meeting of the Farva School Committee. Uh, Deb, would you please call the roll? Mr. Agia? Here. Mr. Bailey? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Ms. Laravey? Here. Ms. Pereira? Here. Ms. Rodericks? Here. Mary Coogan? Here. Salute to the flag, please. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived by those present, and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. Do we have anybody for citizens' input, Deb? Yes, ma'am. So. Okay. First up, Keith Michonne, FREA pre President. I think we need to waive because he's uh, from East Providence. Motion to waive the rules. The motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Keith. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Keith Michon, president of the Fall River Educators Association, and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, I'll keep it brief. First, I'd like to recognize that the Innovator Charter School founders withdrew their application recently. Uh, thank you to everyone that joined us in our campaign against this charter school. Uh, some people have said that the opposition stole opportunities from students, and I'd like to say that that's not true. Um, I want to be clear that we oppose this proposal because our schools already offer uh, what, they, what they offered and much more. Uh, we have a great STEM programming in our middle schools and many early college opportunities in our high schools. Uh, I'd like to ask the committee to continue to support these efforts and opportunities and I look forward to seeing us exp expand this work in the future. Thank you. As much as I, be I believe in our ability to provide top-notch opportunities for Fall River students, I have to comment on the retention issue that was brought up last meeting. Challenging behaviors, high class lo case loads, constant change and insufficient preparation time has people working beyond their capacity. This along with overemphasis on standardized testing and underappreciation for the work educators do leaves people looking for other opportunities. On top of educators being pushed beyond their capacity, Many are being forced to sub during their prep periods, further compounding <clears throat> these issues. We recognize this is necessary in emergency situations, but in some schools this has become a regular occurrence. This shouldn't be a surprise to anyone, uh, given our current state, and I don't think any single person is responsible, but I think we can do better. Lastly, I'd like to comment on our plan to lift the mask mandate. I surveyed my membership, and of the 460 responses, 80% would be willing to, are okay with lifting the mask mandate on March 14th, uh, assuming that rates continue to fall. If we lift the mask mandate on February 28th, that drops down to about 48%. Um, so please consider this and our local data uh, when you discuss this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, also, we have a letter, uh, uh, Deb, please. From Colin Dias of Ray Street in Fall River. Good afternoon, members of the Fall River School Committee. <clears throat> I hope the mayor doesn't censor my speech or he will be sued. I hope that I hope to let the public know what parts of my speech they do illegally censor if they do censor it. I am speaking in regards of a few items on tonight's agenda in general. First of all, I want to give my highest accolades to the kitchen nutrition staff of the Fall River Public Schools. They deserve more help and support. I would like to see the school committee look into initiative ideas to see the staff work with local farms and other venues to provide 100% nutritional meals to our students. Let's give the money to the local businesses and build up our outreach to the local community. They deserve the funds. Now I have some questions on where some funds are currently going. First of all, I have some questions about the contract for the Boys and Girls Club. Are we just paying for an empty room for a rental? Or is the Boys and Girls Club going to provide some actual services in exchange for taxpayer funds? That's a question I would be asking. 
I, hope, I also hope Mimi Larravee knows she has to recuse herself this time, like when she should have with Malone. Another question I have are the travel requests. Why is the dean, Mike Costa, requesting reimbursement of $50 just for a business trip to Providence? That may not be a lot of funds, but it's taxpayer funds, and that just looks cheap asking for a school committee for $50. Also, why is Dr. Taylor requesting over $1,000 for their business trip to Orlando? The public should see how its $1,400 is being used. My last concern is why the roads to all our city schools were not paved this morning. It was like Antarctica. The students of the city do not deserve to be on unsafe roads due to the administration poor leadership. Honestly, people could have been in serious danger. These roads were barely touched. Full-time leadership. Thank you very much for your time, Colin Dias. Well, we have no recognition awards tonight, so we'll jump right to the superintendent's report. Um, Superintendent Ponce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll start with our power schools update. Um, our core uh, student information system the data is being mapped from Aspen by PowerSchool data team. Our um, SIMS team uh, reviewed the student file upload to PowerSchool. We actually did some spot checking to check on files, uh, student files, and all the data is matching up correctly to what is in Aspen for demographics, IDs, phone, addresses, et cetera. Also for staff, data is being mapped out from Aspen to PowerSchool for uh, staff data with exceptions. We have not had a meeting to review mapping out yet, but um, that's scheduled for uh, right after February vacation. Staff attendance, which is new after reviewing attendance and accrual management options in both Frontline, which we currently use, and PowerSchool, it was decided with uh, Mr. Coogan to stick with Frontline for next year and potentially if we want to uh, integrate and then go to um, uh, adopt the PowerSchool attendance um, uh, uh, option we will um, the year after. Health, we had a kickoff uh, meeting on February 7th and administrator training with uh, our nurse Karen Long. Um, currently, they're reviewing various reference tables used in the health to add and delete and to create that profile. Our special needs, um, we're still working through the direction of migrating live data this year. We've already scheduled all the special needs training uh, sessions for conversion. We have a few options that we can use as we move forward. Uh, we either could have PowerSchool transfer two years of live data. They will, as part of the plan, they will uh, transfer multiple years of um, data that's inactive, and then we're looking to do two years of live data um, into the system. Uh, that will uh, be a process that is still ongoing. Registration, PowerSchool uploaded all three languages and test registrations were done successfully by follow public schools and the target of March 1 to go live as we register our students via PowerSchool. And then training, training is ongoing, has been informational and successful. We anticipate rolling out <coughs> advanced training to users in early April and accounts um, Frank Farias is setting up a th uh, a th uh, authentication uh, accounts for single sign-on so that Google credentials will be um, the PowerSchool credentials as well, so they're gonna sync, and we're gonna need to institute a new policy of forced um, resets for security when that's ready. But that's, um, it, I will say the PowerSchool migration is um, on target and is moving along very, um, very well. Uh, I'm meeting with, uh, uh, Mr. Um, Cabral and Mr. Michael Azik weekly, and we discuss where we are in the status, what the needs are, et cetera. So that's it for power schools. We also have an update. Um, if you recall, at the last meeting, a motion was made and a vote was taken to provide schools with additional uh, school adjustment counselor positions, SEL positions. We reviewed our data and needs. Uh, I met with Claudia. She created this data sheet. We looked at our schools and um, students on IEPs and what the ratios were. And as a, re a result, we have targeted, prioritized um, seven schools to receive an additional uh, SAC. Uh, Durfee for Freshman Academy, their numbers have grown tremendously. They have 641 students. Uh, we all know that that transition is uh, challenging. 
and uh, there is a lot of need at that uh, with freshmen as they transition to high school. More, uh, each of the middle schools will also receive an additional SAC. Uh, Morton has 62 set, uh, students that require SAC services via their IEP. Talbot also has um, students, 28 students who require SAC services in addition to all the other needs for all of our other students. CUS has 37 students that require SAC services in their IEP. Um, Henry Lord uh, will receive an additional SAC because of their um, services as well as they have 799 students. They have 21 students who receive SAC services and they also have a broad range, um, K, uh, K to, to eighth grade. So um, she will tier you know, uh, her SACs K to two, three to five, six to, th to eight. Uh, Fonseca, as we know, is a level four school. Currently, they have two school adjustment counselors and one student support coordinator. The student support co coordinator does a lot of coordinating uh, of services and care for families, so um, they certainly can use uh, another uh, school adjustment counselor. Um, they're a very high need school. They service 683 students. And um, Laterno currently has two SACs in the building. Um, and they have 17 students who require SAC services. They also um, this year absorbed Step Up program for ASD. They currently have 633 students. Um, additionally, uh, we would like to use the remaining three positions for guidance. We'd like to add an additional guidance um, to each middle school to be aligned with caseload ratios. Currently, CUS has a 359 to one ratio. Morton has a 347 to one ratio for guidance and Talbot has a 311 to one ratio. A third set, um, guidance counselor in each school will allow those guidance counselors to um, not be uh, caught up in all, uh, uh, in their offices all day uh, doing paperwork, scheduling, et cetera, will divide up those uh, duties and they will actually be able to do some proactive work, support students, create groups, do a lot of uh, career work and push into classrooms. That would be our, um, currently, our proposal for those additional positions. Certainly we are in the budget price process. All of our schools have advocated for additional SEL needs and we are taking that into consideration, but that's the immediate need. We posted the position right after the um, vote and currently we have had 12 applicants. And, <clears throat> COVID update. Um, as you know, we're seeing a decrease in positive cases within our schools and within our community. The data is uh, trending in the right direction. This has been and continues to be a collaborative effort. We cannot thank our staff, students, and families enough. We are where we are because of everyone doing their part. Even when people didn't necessarily agree, they do what is needed to, get, um, to make sure that everybody is safe. Um, we've implemented the at-home testing program district-wide, both for students and staff. Students and staff receive their at-home, those who sign up receive their at-home kits every other week. Uh, each kit has two tests, so they're able to test weekly. Our testing day is Wednesday. We're also continuing with symptomatic testing at all schools. Our nurses are conducting testing with support from the folks from CIC. We are continuing to follow the CDC guidelines, Department of Health guidelines for those testing positive. Five days of isolation upon their return with improved symptoms, masks are required. Um, and we continue to work dilig diligently mitigating the spread and will continue to do so by exercising caution uh, within our buildings, deep cleaning, daily sanitizing, distancing as much as possible, frequent hand, hand washing will all continue. <coughs> As you know, the mask mandate will be lifted by Commissioner Riley on February 28th. At that point, the decision will be remanded to local control. This is on our agenda in a little bit, and we'll have a discussion as to um, where we need to go as a district moving forward. And the last but not least is our capital projects. Um, Durfee High School, um, the new Durfee Progress, the main academic core building, is substantially complete with punch list items remaining. The remainder of the exterior of the field house is 95% complete with hardy board installation ongoing. Foundation work at the base of the field house ramp is almost complete in preparation for the installation of the new south stairwell. Total construction workers present on Monday through Friday is averaging eight, approximately to 10 workers on Saturdays. Um, the old Durfee, the demolition is 95% complete with only one stairwell left standing.
there's been over a thousand truckloads of demolition material hauled from that site. The abatement process is 100% complete in, uh, in the entire old structure. The site contractor will begin mobilizing for the remaining drainage work. Future Durfee Fieldhouse and tennis courts um, design work on the soccer field and the tennis courts is underway and remaining site work is close to complete design. The Watson renovation, phase two bids have been received and the general contractor tower construction will be awarded the contract. The city will sign the contract and, and mobilization will begin with, within the next 45 days. Henry Lord, the boiler replaced design work is ongoing for a new boiler plant. <coughs> We're currently operating the building with temporary rental boilers. And at Talbot, the installation of the old greenhouse from Durfee is going to start during the week of March 1st. The science lab renovations are ongoing using the old labs from the uh, old Durfee. And the special needs district offices renovations are 60% complete at the Pace building for the new office space dedicated to special needs and other back office operations. Rough framing, plumbing, HVAC, VAC and electrical work has been completed and inspected. Drywall and taping is ongoing with anticipation of March 20th for painting and ceiling installation to begin thereafter. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the update, uh, Ms. Ponce. Any questions? Mr. Aguiar? One of the things I'd like to request is that we get a copy of these things in writing just so that I'm just looking back and I can't uh, find the uh, details about what was just presented. The power school update, we brought that up at one of the meetings about the um, IEPs being PDF. Is this now satisfied? There was, no. a, there was a debate over and I, I can't remember the language that you used, about two years live. Or like, mm -hmm. Can we get a detail on what that means? Sure. Do you, it, it is not satisfied, I will say. It's, um, it's ongoing. Uh, we have to determine how we're going to integrate that live uh, data. They, the contract said that they would give us the PDF information, and then we have to determine how we will uh, migrate the live. So one piece of it is the original contract stated that they would give us 14 years of historical PDF data. Um, and when Mike and his team looked at that, they just felt that we'd be doing a disservice to the teachers that are in the classroom to have to funnel through that PDF while there's a student in the classroom or on their prep time. So what we asked Power School was if there was a way for them to give us at least 18 to 24 months of live data. So that way it's inputted and it's not a PDF and it can be seen on the screen in real time so that they can toggle between different sections of the IEP. When we met with Power Schools initially, they said that it was a no-go because of the way our current Aspen is interfaced. We have a journal entry. So they were having a real hard time grasping their collective engineering heads around how we make that journal entry get into their system. Um, Brian Michael Azik then worked off the scene and he figured out a way to get them a file that they could work with. So now they have a file, a, um, a demo file, and they have a demo IEP of a student, and they're working behind the scenes on a gap analysis that's basically going to be able to map everything in our journal entry by cell so that A equals A in the new system, B equals B, so that way Mike and his team have Historical data will still have the 14 years, so even the last two years that we're going to, you know, transition to will still be in PDF form, but we'll also have them on the screen power school so a teacher can toggle between everything live. Um, they're in the beginning stages of that. Brian has also given them an additional file. Um, we're still going back and forth with power school on the best way to do this. They've never done it um, with the way our system is configured, so they're they're having a hard time grasping the information, but I had a call as recently as last Thursday, and they're trending in the right direction. Um, they have a, a whole team on it. And then once we get to that point, we're gonna bring Brian and his team back in, and we're gonna figure out a way to get both systems to merge. Um, so we're, I'd say 50% there, but the anticipation on the district side is to be able to have a teacher be able to see at least two years of live data, um, and then also have the historical PDFs. So just for the edification of the other members, at the subcommittee this was brought up. This is a major issue as far as I'm concerned. So we were presented as a full body by the power school folks in public meetings where they were selling their product. In that discussion they said it was going to be a seamless transition with all of our programs including those of special education. 
So I wasn't too happy at the meeting to hear that the fine print within the contract said something otherwise. So if I recall, the date was January 26th that they were going to have another meeting. At that public meeting, I suggested with other colleagues that were on the subcommittee that we go back to them and tell them that they need to fix this, otherwise we're going to have them at a, at a meeting to address it because they lied to us, basically. So I think that people are just not getting the idea that it's not just, well, we have to now jump through hoops. They sold us a bill of goods. It shouldn't be us having to jump through hoops yourself, Mr. Michaelizek, Mr. Loesch. It shouldn't be that way. They want to run a program. They're going to tell us that they've done huge, they, they sold us a bill of goods. There's been issues in other districts in the past with the same exact issue that I found out after the meeting, that other districts had to go and get lawyers to, to get them out of the special education module. So for any of those folks to tell you that, that's not, that this is just no big deal, that's not accurate. So when I asked at the meeting via the superintendent to come back to us after the 26th and tell us what happens, it, it's not done yet. It sounds good, oh, we're going to get two years. None of that's agreed to yet. And time is going on. So I think we need to get something down in writing about exactly what's going to happen. If they can't get it done, the next school committee meeting, we need to have power school representatives come before us and stand right there and tell us why they're not going to do what they said they were going to do. I can't, I, I, I can't believe that we were having this discussion. Never mind the fact that somebody should have caught it when it came out in, in writing about what it was and what it wasn't. So I'm not blaming you gentlemen, but it just not, doesn't sit well with me that we, we're paying a lot of money for this and we say one thing and then it's just going to keep on, you know, next month maybe. Maybe we'll try this. We shouldn't have to do this. It's on them. It's not on us. With that, I yield on this issue. Anything further? Thank you. Next one more up. question. I, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, uh, Mr. Aguirre. I just had that power school issue. The, it, the COVID update, Mrs. Ponce mentioned something about if a student, I, I think it was like if they... If they've been found positive, then they have to come in, they have to wear a mask? Mm -hmm. How would well, the implementation of that go? Well, if we are notified, a student or an adult, that's, that's the um, Board of Health um, and Department of Health. A student, they reduced from 10 days being home to five days. So first five days, you're in isolation at home. Second five days, if you have reduced symptoms or no symptoms, you can f return to school or to work you have to mask up for the remaining five days. So if we know, which we, we are notified when someone is positive, they would have to return. If they return before, the, after the five days, they would have to have a, a mask. So basically, in essence, telling everybody that they were positive. Well, the, the alternative is them isolating for 10 days at home. That's, that, that, that's not us. That's the Department of Health um, guidelines. I hear you, but we got to implement yeah. it. So that's yeah, absolutely. That, oh, when I you agree. said that, it was just, yep. if first comes up, I'm sure we'll have more discussion about it, but mm -hmm. that just begged that question. With yep. that, I yield. Thank you. <coughs> Anything further? Okay. Uh, tonight, joining us, um, Durfee student Sadie Fitzgerald. Um, welcome, Sadie. Do you have anything you want to fill us in on tonight? Um, I have nothing that I'd like to fill you in on tonight, but thank you for having me here. Well, glad you joined us. Hope to hear from you next meeting. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm um, looking for the approval of the minutes from the regular school committee on 110.22. Can I get a motion? Motion to approve. Second in. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on those minutes from 110? Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Haggia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Laravi? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Cooper? <coughs> yes. Next is the approval of the minutes from the Special Ed, Alternative Ed, and Early College Subcommittee meeting of 120. Motion to approve the minutes. Second. I have a motion to second. Discussion? Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Laravi? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. And finally, approval of the minutes of the Parent and Community Outreach Subcommittee meeting from 125-22. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion. Second. By Bobby, Bobby second. second. Second by Bobby. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, good discussion. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Here. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Laravi? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. 
Item number seven is approval for travel requests. Um, we have three of them. Uh, anybody have any objections to the travel requests? Hearing none, I'll accept them all at once. Can I get a motion, please? Motion to approve travel requests. Any, any second? Second. Uh, I have a motion to second. Discussion? I think, could I just, uh, I just kind of want to make a point. Ms. Pereira? I want to make a point in regards to the citizens' input, just so the community understands we're not uh, handing out thousands of dollars for people to go on vacations. It looks like this travel request here by Dr. Curley um, is up to seven participants. It's regarding Carnegie Math, which is um, math curriculum that we're implementing um, in the schools and um, makes sense, $1,400. And then also, you know, this $51, which was also talked about. And I think pretty much across the board, um, you get travel, you get reimbursed for mileage. This is something that's common. Um, this is not something that is outlandish or crazy. When you're asked to travel for work, you get reimbursed on your travel. Um, so I don't have a problem with that, but I just wanted to mention that um, just so the community understood it and didn't. Um, weren't misled. And that's all I yield. Thank you. I have a motion to second. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes. Item number eight is an acceptance of donations. We have a number of them. Um, I'd like to take a, uh, a motion and a second to accept them and then let, let Superintendent Ponce explain them. Make motion to accept donations. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agio? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Um, Superintendent? Uh, thank you. On behalf of Jackie Francisco uh, from the Fine Arts Department, uh, from Fall River Cultural Council, $3,000. Um, on behalf of Dr. Liz Dunn to Green School, from Donors Choose, $750. On behalf of Eric Principal Bradley uh, to Doran School, from Colonial Honda of Dartmouth, $750. On behalf of Jackie Francisco, um, for the Fine Arts Department from Fall River Cultural Council, $599. On behalf of Jackie Francisco to the Fall River Public Schools Fashion Program from Point Line Space, $500. On behalf of Principal Hogue um, from, uh, at Watson School, $486 from Donors Choose. On behalf of Principal Hogue um, at Watson School, uh, from donors choose common corner tent lab uh, blanket <clears throat> rug and timer Thank you. Thank you uh, Item number nine is the approval of contracts Mr. Um, chairperson could you uh, make boys and girls club separate, please? Uh, take the boys club separate any other requests Can I get a motion and a second motion to approve second I got a motion and a second Deb, please call the roll, excluding the boys' club. Boys and girls' club. <laughs> Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Uh, I'll take a motion and a second on the rental agreement with the boys' club. Boys and girls' club. Boys and girls' club. She's correcting me again. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. The boys and girls' club. Can I get a motion? Motion. We got a motion and a second. Deb, please call the roll. Question on that? I'm sorry, Mr. Aguiar? I think this is for a couple of months. Just a couple of months. Is that what this is for? And then yes. Three months. And then there's no obligations. Remaining of the year. For the remaining of the year. Right, and then there's yes. We'll yes. figure it out after. Thank you, are you? Mm -hmm. uh, Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Aguiar? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hawk? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Abstain. Ms. Perra? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Item number 10 is an approval of grants. Oh. We have one grant, math acceleration. I'm looking Mr. for a motion in a I second. Have, uh, I, I 
Ms. Larravee? I did have a question on contracts. I went for my, um, Apollo Safety, the um, dispensary. Um, can I just get an update? Is, is, are the uh, dispensers up? Oh, okay. We're moving forward. Okay. Thank you. I yield. I have a, I have a question as well. Okay, Ms. Pereira. Um, you have here 15 sanitary napkin dispensers, 22 tampon dispensers. How many schools does that cover? Because I don't know if you're maybe just putting sanitary napkins in certain schools and not tampons or how that's... So they're combinations? They, each dispenser carries both? Okay. And they're at the high school? They're at the middle school? And they are at um, the nurse's office in the elementary? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Approval of grants is item number 10. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion to approve grants. Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agio? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Laravi? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Item number 11, Committee of the Whole. 11.1 is a pres presentation and discussion on the technology reorganization plan as referred by the facilities and operations subcommittee and presented by Scott Cabral, Chief Information Officer. You're good up, e Scott. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm just gonna preface this before I start the presentation. Um, when I came in as the CIO, I tried to take a broader look at everything, um, but also there are some new members on the committee. Um, I have literally gone through the ranks, so a lot of these positions that I talk about I held at one point in this district, so I have a pretty good handle, I feel, on what we need to move the technology services department forward um, to help the students, the staff, and all the stakeholders within the school department. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Aguiar? Just uh, really doesn't have anything to do with this necessarily, but when I looked at the agenda and we have a subcommittee meeting that's held at 4 o'clock, and now we have a meeting at 5.30. To me, it just doesn't make sense of why would, he's probably gonna give the same presentation he just gave with no, the point of the subcommittee is so that we can actually ask questions at subcommittee. Other members can watch, get some clarity before we actually get the presentations. In this case, we have a whole bunch of things that were on a subcommittee meeting one hour before the meeting, and now we're gonna have the regular meeting right thereafter without any I just don't understand the rationale for why, why this is even being presented today, not have anything to do with the issue, the content of the issue. Structurally, it doesn't make any sense why we have a subcommittee meeting, and then therefore immediately thereafter we're going to have, the, I guess, the same presentation because it was already on, on our uh, agenda here for, for, what, for backup information. So I just, don't, I just don't see the rationale behind it, and we're going to go through other other items, the same thing, as referred, as referred. Well, it's kind of presumptuous to just assume everything's going to get referred as is with the backup data. I don't think we should be having subcommittee meetings one hour before the other meeting and then bringing up the issue. Why don't we wait till next month when we can all digest what happened at the subcommittee? Superintendent, if, if I could just clarify, Mr. Aguiar, you're correct. It, it was scheduled. This meeting actually was scheduled for last week. It had to be um, rescheduled due to some unforeseen circumstances. And uh, in trying to coordinate everyone's schedule, um, it was agreed upon to have it today with the understanding that we were putting those items on the agenda as placeholders. And if the committee did not refer, then we didn't expect. We're not gonna presume that it's automatically gonna get approved. But, I mean, we're not asking for, um, Scott is simply presenting. He's been a CIO for a while now. He's looked at the, uh, the department. He's trying to build his department. He just wants to share his thinking about the department. Certainly, we can come back in March if you want to. Part of his plan includes, it's going to include, it's going to be included in his budget presentation. Um, so it wasn't intended for it to be the, the same day as the committee. It was circumstances that made it be today. Yeah. I. I I can respect that. I, I'm not debating whether you can have the subcommittee meeting. What I'm just talking about is we're having the follow-up meeting to that meeting less than an hour mm -hmm. after it. That's, you know, has nothing to do with Mr. Cabral or the technology piece. It just, 
uh, system wide. I, I just don't understand why the point of the subcommittees is so we can digest the issues and get into the a granular detail a little more than normal so we could watch the meeting. I haven't seen it. I'm going to see it now for the first time. Um, I just don't understand why it wasn't just said, okay, we, can't, we have to have the subcommittee meeting, so why put all this other stuff on the agenda? But if that's the case, we go through, and if I have 47 questions on this issue, I don't want people looking at me like, why are you asking these questions? That's, oh. that's my problem, that if, if we're going to do it, we have a presentation, <clears throat> so then any questions should be allowed to be answered. I don't know what was said or wasn't said at the subcommittee. I would assume that they did a thorough job of investigating and asking questions, but I haven't seen it, so... I yield. Mr. Cabral. Okay, so I'm just going to give you some brief highlights of where we are currently, you know, in the department. Uh, we service the 17 buildings that we have in the city, over 10,000 students, close to 2,000 staff members, and at any point, any of the parents that call in. Um, it has truly become a 24-7 operation um, with the, um, the pandemic. It's taught us a lot. It's taught us how to be more efficient, and it's taught us to run the department um, that everyone at every end user is always going to need some type of service through, you know, through the school day, the weekend, even on vacations. Um, we've just completed, you know, the installation of a new VoIP phone system, um, 2,500 student Chromebooks, 450 teacher devices at the new Durfee High School. Uh, which also included um, on our end installing all of the network infrastructure as far as switches and background equipment. Um, we've successfully completed 4,000 plus technology support tickets uh, from our students and staff since July 1st of 2021. Um, since the pandemic, we've just purchased close to 3,000 new Chromebooks. Um, to start the school year, it's been one of our largest um, Chromebook purchases to date. Um, we've managed to um, enroll all 3,000 with the very limited staff that we have, and we are continuing to um, swap in and out broken and aged out devices um, on the day. Um, at any day, it can be between 15 and 30 that we're swapping out for schools and buildings. Um, this past summer, we purchased and installed a new cloud-based print server called PaperCut, which makes it um, much easier um, to print from Chromebooks across the district. It also allows uh, staff members to save their um, work and then print it at any building. They can also upload their information from home and then print at the school building when they get there. Um, we received approval from E-Rate for this uh, coming year to upgrade the wireless infrastructure and switching equipment at Talbot, Doran, and RPS. Um, through the E-Rate project, we've been successfully able to modernize um, not just these three buildings, but um, many of the buildings over the course of the years. Um, this coming year, we're going to look at doing a complete rewire of the Henry Lord School with E-Rate funding. <laughs> Um, in the process right now, we're um, undertaking the biggest project in the technology services um, realm uh, with the implementation of our new SIS system power schools. Um, we have begun the process of updating all of the classroom AV technology with the installation of Promethean boards. We're using the current high school to basically model every other classroom in the district with this type of technology. So that way, not only do the children get it from K to 12, but the staff members can cross train across the district. And it'll also allow us as a department to be more efficient in turning around broken uh, devices. No longer are we gonna have the days where school A has one type of projector, school B has a different type of projector. Teachers won't be down anymore. We plan on having a small stockpile of replacement devices so that we can swap out um, classrooms and they'll be down hours instead of days and or weeks. Um, we've successfully allowed all of our internal network connections to stream the meeting that we have now. Um, we've worked with Fred TV and we're able to stream our meetings um, through the network. They can go live anywhere in the network. Um, Alex, Renee, and the team at Fred TV have been a very big part of the technology services side um, and they've become a very big partner in our team. Um, doing all of these projects, again, with a very limited staff. So where we're headed, um, we have a lot of projects in the pipeline. We're going to first finish the conversion of our schools to the new VoIP systems. That's going to end all of our legacy support for all of our analog buildings. Um, in addition, we're going to research and implement um, the 911, it's called granular, granular, 
relity, I'm sorry, it's a tongue twister, at each site. So basically what's gonna happen now is if a 911 call is made in classroom 237 at Cuss Middle School, it's gonna route to the police station and the 911 call center and say that the call <coughs> came from classroom 230 at Cuss Middle School. Um, it's gonna allow for a quicker response time. It'll also uh, flag the SROs and the security members inside the school to know where the call is coming from and administrators to you know, streamline resources to that area. We're gonna, um, we're in the process. Um, it's an ongoing process because we have so many devices of our new asset management and ticketing system, Incident IQ. Um, it's again, ongoing, it's going to encompass over our 14,000 devices across the network. So our technicians are going into rooms and if they're fixing a printer, they're asset tagging and they're recording phones, classroom AV, teacher devices, document cameras, the whole nine yards. So if a teacher calls in, and says that her document camera is no longer working, we can actually look back historically at the issues that those devices have had, so if it's a replacement and or repair, and it also helps us on the district level see if there's a bigger issue with a certain device. We're able to use that data to forecast our future with these devices. Um, we've just recently installed and purchased our new firewall as part of the building project. Um, this works in turn with our um, content filtering system relay by light speed. Um, so we have a double whammy for protection on our devices. Relay works on the Chromebooks for the students. It also filters their devices at home, so they're not looking at content that is not appropriate. And we also have the Fortinet system, which is part of our LAN system that protects all of our devices and our legacy systems within the network. Um, we're in the process of implementing our new communication platform, Parent Square. This is gonna repl uh, replace Remind and also replace School Messenger. This will allow the district to be on one platform. So School A will no longer be using one platform and School B will be using a different one. It's very hard to manage in the background. It's also very difficult to create PDs for across the district. So now by going to this, we'll be able to streamline our PD, we'll be able to streamline our support, and it's also, um, used in different languages, so um, a parent would receive the call in the language that is on the student information system when they receive that call, it will be translated. Um, we are going to continue and finalize and implement Power Schools. Um, Power Schools will go live on March 1st for registrations at the Parent Information Center, and then July 1 it will be live uh, for our student information system moving forward, um, and just as some background information on that. We will maintain Aspen for one more fiscal year. Um, there's a lot of data there, and even though that they're transferring all that data to the new system, um, Mr. Michael Isaac and his team need Aspen to complete state reporting for that current year. So we will maintain Aspen for one more year. Um, we're in the researching stages right now, and um, a committee has been um, assigned internally with the stakeholders in the district for our new technology plan with the state. Our current plan is ending in 2021, so we will be looking at our new four-year plan moving forward, and that will have more um, information regarding the tech integration, the curriculum side, equipment refresh as we move forward. Um, we're working on a new Chromebook maintenance protocol. We're trying to develop a system where Chromebook issues are gonna be picked up at each building every week. They're gonna come back to the district location. If the device is deemed repairable, it will be repaired and sent back to the district. If not, it will be replaced. Um, we have found that with the addition of the new devices, we have many old devices and legacy devices. So Google, um, they have this plan internally where if a device is more than eight years old, it's no longer available for updates. So basically, in the K-12 education realm, it becomes a paperweight. So what we're doing with some of those devices as they age out is we're Frankensteining them for parts because an LCD screen on an old device that may not be able to require an update, we can still use that LCD screen in a newer device if there's an accident where a screen you know, cracks or breaks. So we're implementing that process. It's gotten so big so quick. We never realized 18 months ago that we'd be at this number of Chromebooks. So, and, and I will be totally honest with you, it's an ongoing process. We're learning from our mistakes. We're making uh, strides to correct those mistakes. We're also making strides to become more efficient in that process. I anticipate that at this time next year, we will have a full process where we have it written down on paper. All of our technicians are following the same thing. 
We're actually looking for best practices from certain technicians. Certain technicians have a great way of doing things. We're implementing that across the district. So it is a work in process. Um, I'm excited about it because it's something that we can tweak and we can make our own. And the technicians have all bought in on it and they're all excited as well. Um, we're going to begin uh, training for PD on all of this, these new systems. So Remind, uh, I'm sorry, Parent Square, Power Schools, Incident IQ. There's going to be ongoing training. Um, as part of this presentation, you'll see the need for uh, additional technology facilitators, and they're going to be the ones that are facilitating that PD across the district where we can, again, target the instruction to the staff members so that everyone is seeing the same PD and everyone is on the same page. Right now, there are so many different variables out there that the PD is not targeted to one platform. So with the addition of these new platforms and that targeted PD, we'll be able to better serve the staff and the students. Um, we're implementing a new safety software called Social Sentinel um, that basically looks for keywords as far as like a threat in a building. If there is a threat of violence in a building, it scans a geographical circumference of that building um, and it notifies Correct. currently central office, and then we would begin the investigation process, whether or not we would have to get the SROs involved. I can tell you, um, and Mr. Coogan can speak to it, we used it uh, about six years ago, um, and it was a, re uh, a very good resource for us in the district, and they've made great strides in the software, so we're excited to implement that across the district. Um, and I currently have begun to research and develop plans to update the network infrastructure as far as wireless. We've done quite a bit of additional access points across the district, but also, as you know, you can buy a car today and it's out of date six months from now. Wireless is making a big change. It's called Wi-Fi 6. It requires a bit more infrastructure, but it also allows more devices on the network. And when we think about all of the Chromebooks and teacher devices that we have on the network, we're going to be looking to leverage some of those E-rate funds in the coming years to start to do a cycle out of equipment. Currently the high school is set up for Wi-Fi 6 because we had the forethought to make sure that we were good there. Um, and now what I'd like to do is I'd like to start to trickle that down by looking at the middle schools first and then the elementary schools as we move forward. So when we talk about the needs in the department, um, technology integration is where I'd like to start. So we have the umbrella of technology services and then we have three umbrellas. We have technology integration, we have student information management systems, and then we have technology services. On the technology integration side, um, the director and his team are responsible for PD. Um, currently their jobs have kind of meshed into the break fix side as well because we're so short staffed. Um, Mr. Farias and his team do tremendous work, um, but they are very understaffed. Um, they have not had additional uh, positions up until this year. We have two positions currently posted, uh, one that we've um, just found the right individual for and one that we still have posted on the elementary level. Um, but going forward this year, um, we have currently the director of integration. We have two high school technology facilitators. One of them is not a district employee. He is housed at the um, Durfee High School. He is part of the Durfee High School team um, and he helps us out when needed. Um, and when he's not, we have our um, high school integration specialist that jumps from the high school and she's also helping right now with the implementation of Power School as well as Illuminate. We have um, one middle school technology facilitator for the district, and we have the five Vils technology facilitators. And then, like I said, we have currently one elementary technology facilitator for all our, our buildings, and we have the two posted. One has just been um, brought on. She's going to be starting on March 14th, and we're very excited for her to come in. She um, currently works in New Bedford, and she has a, a, look, a different look at the technology there, so she's going to be a, an added member to the team. Um, so when I say that we need some extra help in that department, what we're looking for, I apologize the slide, um, we're looking to add two additional uh, middle school facilitators. What that's going to allow the director of the uh, department to do is split up the workload between all the middle schools. Um, his idea currently looks as if we'll have uh, one middle school facilitator to work in the K-8 to middle schools, and then he'll have one um, person work with the traditional middle schools, and then we're looking at third person in the middle school to kind of oversee the Vils uh, coaches, to have a district resource so that we can start to implement district ideas across the, uh, you know, the district um, in these schools. 
typically these individuals before COVID hit would be out in the schools, they'd be pushing into curriculum meetings, they'd be doing trainings out in the, in the buildings. Right now it's very difficult to do that because we have so much back end support that needs to happen with the Chromebook initiative, with the filtering, that these people have literally been working 10, 11 hours a day to make sure our back end systems are correct. Um, and then the new position that we'd like to bring in so that we can have those individuals be in the classrooms with the teachers and the students and push the PD and the new systems is called uh, technology systems manager. That position is gonna work directly with the uh, director of the department. Uh, they're gonna be responsible for all the legacy software support, the user accounts, all of the back end pieces that currently the director has to take a piece of, which takes away from his day to day duties, what some of the facilitators are doing right now that takes away from their day to day duties. This will allow that person to just focus in on the back end systems and allow our team to get out into the buildings and do what they want to do. They would love to be doing the maker spaces and the STEM pieces. They'd love to be doing the wiki spaces. They'd love to be in the classrooms working with the students and the staff. And with the addition of these positions, they'll be able to do just that, what, what they're, they want to be doing. And the systems manager position will be taking care of the back end piece. I do, in, I do um, see that this systems manager position, although it's gonna be under the integration side, is gonna work heavily with the other um, departments under that umbrella. They're gonna work with um, the SIMS team to work on the data side because a lot of what we use in our other systems comes from the SIMS piece. So all the user accounts are actually created with the data that's in the SIMS side. So this person is gonna be a swing position. However, we'll report to the director of integration because that's where a majority of the workload is, but they will also be working with the other two facets of the department. So the second piece is the student information system, the management system, SIMS. I will say that the power school piece is gonna probably be one of the biggest um, pro, you know, programs that we've brought into the district in a long time. Uh, if you talk to Mr. Michael Lazik, it, it's when we brought Aspen in, okay? So this is gonna be a huge undertaking. Um, and there are gonna be hiccups along the way. Um, we're gonna see that the system is doing things one way. Brian has already identified some spots where we'd like to manipulate what power school does. Power school does do it away, but there have been great working with us on certain aspects of it. The biggest piece will be um, the SPED data. Um, and I, you know, I am confident that Power Schools is gonna make right uh, the situation. Mike and I have been talking with Kristen Farias um, and we're in a good spot. Um, I'll have more information that Maria can share in the Friday email with the school committee, but um, I did meet with them again this afternoon via Zoom. Um, they really did like the file that Brian created, so we're in a good spot there. However, when you bring in a system like this, there's a need. So Brian has a need because he currently has two members. He has a data specialist and he has a data technician. When we talk about bringing power schools on, Brian's team is still going to have to do the state reporting for next year, right? So we have state reporting, which takes quite a bit of legwork. When you create, you know, when you correct one error, 10 new errors can be found. So there's, it's a seesaw and it's a, it's a balancing act to get all of that information correct. So we're asking in that department for an additional data specialist so that it can help with the power school side while we're doing the other piece. And then there's another agenda item coming up. There's an immediate need right now that Brian has brought to my attention um, for someone to help with this implementation. Currently we're sharing a technology integration specialist on, on Mr. Farias' side. We need somebody that can be with Brian every day. Um, so that position is called a database manager position and uh, we can talk about that in the next agenda item. The last piece um, where there is the biggest need is technology services. Um, for years, you've heard Ken and I talk about the wires and the pliers guys. These are the individuals that keep the fleet running, they keep all the core systems running, security cameras, phones, the whole nine yards. It's the busiest piece. Um, that's where I spent most of my time in the district. Um, so that's the piece that I feel most confident that we can do so much better but we have to do it a little bit differently. So what I'd like to do there is we currently have a director's position that I would like to no longer fill. I think that the director's position there is a position that at one point was needed, but I think now with the changing technologies and the change in the structure that I'm proposing, it would be much better suited for us to look at it in a different way. Um, currently in the department, we again have the director. We have two senior technicians. We have seven junior technicians. 
We have four VILS technicians which are responsible for that VILS program, and we contract out currently for firewall services. It's not some, that's a niche. It's, it's not something that we have internally. It's a full-time job, and the individual that we contract out, that's all this person does. Um, so I could have easily come to you and said, I want to have a security appliance specialist, but we would have out-budgeted ourselves for a position like that, and it's financially, I think, more responsible for us to leave it as contracted services right now because we can save money. It's not something that we need every day. However, that contracted individual, if we call at 1.30 that the sky is falling, they stop what they're doing, and they help us out. So that relationship has been excellent, and I'd like to continue that relationship. So what we're requesting on that side would be to phase out that director position and create a number of positions. The first one I'm going to take out of order from the slides that you guys have is another VILS technician for Doran School. Currently, we have one um, individual that's splitting time at Doran and Henry Lord. We all know that Henry Lord's numbers are rising. It's just too much work for one person. Currently, that individual spends three days a week at Henry Lord and two days a week at Doran. And then the following week, they rotate. Um, however, it's not fair to both schools, and that individual is literally, he's drowning. We're, so, we're giving district supports on the regular there to help out with his workload, but this is just going to allow that, that technician to be able to oversee. He also oversees the VILS technician, so they report to him. So he'll be able to do some more of that supervisory stuff because he won't be trying to fit in both buildings. He's working 10, 11 hours a day because he doesn't want to leave work undone. Um, but sometimes in the VILS program, just the repairs alone take two hours. The process of getting the repair tag from Samsung, doing the process, and then dropping off the devices. So this position will allow us to be a little more efficient on that side. Um, I'd like to bring back, you all know that I was one at one point the network administrator. I'd like to bring that position back because our building is now 17 buildings. We have a state-of-the-art high school, and that building alone could have a full-time network person. However, I'd like to look at it from replacing the director with the network admin position and the VoIP admin position. So the network person will be in charge of the network infrastructure, everything from the device all the way back to the switching equipment. Then we would additionally bring on the VoIP admin position. By the end of the summer, every building will be our new voice over IP. It's also going to lower our costs on our Verizon bills because we'll be able to target what lines we want to cancel. Um, the funny thing with VoIP is I can actually say a building of Durfee size used to have 225 lines at the old high school. Now it has four, and it has a group of analog lines for faxing and for the elevators. We can't get away from analog for fire alarm and for elevators, but we can for everything else, and I can create a virtual number that if Mimi, you were calling from the outside, looks like one number, but when it gets into our network, it could actually be a series of four digits. So it's gonna allow us a cost saving. However, currently on staff, the only person that can um, work on that system daily is myself. So I'm trying to limit my time in the office to work on VoIP issues. We have been training someone internally on the staff but it's, it's literally a full-time job. We're going to have 17 buildings of over 3,000 phones across the district. So that's why we're requesting the VoIP admin position. Um, the next position that I'd like to request is a help desk coordinator position. Um, Maria and I and the central admin team have always envisioned having student-run help desks um, across the district. What I'd like this help desk coordinator to do is she, he, he or she is going to be the person that when you call in with an issue, that's going to be the voice that you hear. That person will then route the ticket to the correct technician. However, could possibly bring in the district if there's a larger issue. He or she would you know, report to the CIO. We would get the resources. The one piece that we're seeing is technicians are all doing their work. They're doing it great. But sometimes a ticket gets forgotten because the workload is so diff you know, is great. A ticket gets forgotten. There's no one that's really looking at those checks and balances because everyone is trying to keep everything working. So that person is going to be the voice you hear. They will route the tickets. They will follow up with the tickets. They'll follow up with outside vendors that work on some of our systems and then would report up to the CIO if there's an issue. Um, and the last position is um, a position that I had in a former district that I worked in. It's called the client services coordinator position. So when you think about client, we have close to 13,000 clients, not including parents, so students and staff. Each client has a device. Some clients have multiple devices. 
A teacher can have a laptop, a document camera, an AV device, a classroom telephone, so you can see where the clients have many devices. Currently, we don't have someone that can track those devices. Our incident IQ system can track those devices, but right now, every technician has a little bit different way of handling their asset management system. So this position would come in and see the bigger picture and implement the systems from grade K up through grade 12, administration building, school committee devices, the whole nine yards, where they would be responsible for asset management, they'd be responsible for the clients as well, ticket creation, working hand in hand with the help desk coordinator and the rest of the members of the team to kind of streamline our approach. I also envision that person being the, um, the front runner in the device refresh program. We're gonna let that person decide how we're gonna refresh the devices and the systems and the schedules that we're gonna use. Over the next 24 to 36 months, I do envision roughly 27 to 32 percent of our Chromebook fleet need to be replaced as we move forward because of the aging out of the devices at that eight-year age. However, um, internally we have some Chromebooks now that we're going to start to refresh some of the smaller buildings. Then we're going to take those devices and push them to other buildings, the ones that are worth going to the other buildings. And we also currently have an RFP out right now looking for pricing on an additional thousand devices so we can continue that process. Um, it will be an ongoing process. So every year we're going to come back to the committee and say we'd like to refresh this amount of Chromebooks. Um, the thing that's nice about Chromebooks is the cost is lower. However, they're not necessarily built for long term, and I have three kids, and many of you, you know, people up there have kids. Accidents happen, we understand that, so by doing this type of refresh program, but having someone responsible for it, where all of the data is coming in, and then we can come to you and say, 17% of the devices this year, but we can show you data based off of our ticketing system and this person that's going to be responsible for it. It's just going to make us more efficient. It'll also allow the students and staff to have the most up-to-date devices, which will then limit the issues that we have and will be that much more efficient. Um, so I also included in the presentation, and you guys can take a look at, is just a current org chart and then what we would look like if you all decide to approve these positions. Um, I can answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. And obviously we'll have a, another opportunity to uh, talk further about this when the budget comes forward related to technology. Um, it's, this is just informational. There's no votes involved here tonight. Does anybody have any questions for Scott? Okay, thank you very much. Sure, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I figured somebody else might, but the, um, the Verizon program is all mi mixed in here as it goes. And... Um, What's the timeline for when we're supposed to take all these people on our own budget? Okay, so we're currently in year two of the program. Um, and I will say this, um, we would not have been able to get a device in the hands of every student if it wasn't for the VILS program. On or around the time that we received the devices for the middle schools, some of you that are on the committee will remember we couldn't get any type of device. We were buying devices in allotments of 50, 100. Kevin was, I, I would go up to his office and say, we could get 200 from here, we can get 300 from there. And then tracking all that was just a nightmare. We were driving, I drove on a Saturday to, you know, way out in Rhode Island because FedEx couldn't get us the devices in time. Um, so the first piece I'll say with the Verizon program is they were amazing because they got us those devices and they were able to do it with their capacity where every student at the start of the pandemic had those devices and also had internet access that many may not have. Um, we're currently in, in year two um, and collaboratively with Tracy and with Frank, we have just with the buildings applied for an extension to that grant. Year three, Verizon starts to pull back certain pieces. They pay for the staffing, but in year three, we're gonna see that they don't supply styluses. They don't supply power chargers. Um, we have already been proactive in that, and we have been purchasing aftermarket chargers that are compatible with the devices, and a lot of the buildings are actually seeing that the students are not even using the styluses anymore, they're using their fingers. Um, so when they want styluses, we're buying aftermarket styluses, they don't necessarily fit in the Chromebook slot, however, a lot of the kids are now using their fingers. So the other piece, at the end of year three, 
they're slowly going to start to pull back on the repairs. So we have already had internal discussions, Frank and I have had internal discussions, how we're going to approach that. Um, one of the early ideas is going to be at the end of year three and four is to take the sixth graders, they'll get a new device from the district and we'll take the eighth grade devices that are moving on and we'll use those to gap, it's called a gap order, to plug the gaps for the seventh and eighth graders in the building. And each year, the sixth grader would then take their device to seventh and then eighth and every year we'll take those eighth grade devices and the sixth graders will come in with the new device. So we have that in year four. So in year four, we'll start to do our own equipment refresh at those buildings. We have the capacity now to do it. However, with them repairing them, um, we've allowed them to repair the devices now. The one piece I can say about the VILS program is there is a bit of a lag in the repairs right now. Um, they have gone to a new company. They use Samsung directly for the devices. And um, I can share that information out on Friday, but there are roughly, I want to say, about 130 devices across the district out for repair right now. The problem is not necessarily Samsung, it's a supply chain issue. Uh, a lot of the issues we're seeing are in keyboards and also screens. Screens right now are back ordered six to eight weeks. Um, every building does have spares. Um, however, um, we see that every building does not treat the loaners and spares the same way. Um, so we're going to actually be pushing out from the district level um, increased spares of between 35 and 40 brand new devices. We're actually in the process of labeling those devices now so that they're very clear that they're a loaner. They'll have a label on them that says L1, L2, through however many devices that they have. If at any point the building needs more devices, we will then push those devices out to the building. Um, so we're in a good spot with the Verizon program. I can't necessarily speak to the professional development side. That would be Frank and his team. They use a system called micro-credentialing that is popular in some buildings and other buildings. I think there's still a little bit of a learning curve. They're not so comfortable or familiar with it. Um, but moving forward with the addition of these um, facilitator positions, we'll actually be able to work from the district level to push down what our model would look like so that every building is on the same page moving forward. So the question was, when, is, when do we have to stop paying the, what, what is the years? You were mentioning years, I don't know what the. So in year four, we would be responsible for the positions. The positions are covered years one, two, and three. So year four, we would be responsible for the five facilitators. And then right now, currently, we pay four technicians out of the VILS grant. And then we would be adding one. So that fifth position that we would add if it's approved in the budget cycle would actually come out of school funding because they will not add a position in the VILS grant. And then I know when we had discussed this, when we first voted for it, it was sort of the our backs were against the wall because of COVID and all that stuff. But then you mentioned something about an expansion. I don't recall, maybe I missed it, but did that ever come before the school committee? Um, so Verizon reached out to the VILS buildings and they offered an opportunity for something that's called an immersive grant. Um, it creates an immersive lab. Um, four of our middle schools applied for it and four of our middle schools were approved for it. Um, so basically, I don't know if you remember the, um, the art room at Henry Lord, they came in and they, the Celtics came in and they redid the lab free of charge. Um, so that's what they offered. So the schools applied for that. Um, working with the central office with Maria, they applied for it and they were approved for it. So we're in the early stages of that grant. It gives us an immersive space. Um, Ken and his team have worked with myself and my team um, to make the spaces available. Um, they're actually ahead of timeline and they offer stipends for the current VILS team to oversee that lab space and to oversee the push into the, you know, push into the student body. So they're getting paid twice? So there's a stipend that's available uh, per lab space, um, it's up to the district to decide how that stipend works, whether or not the facilitator gets a piece of it and then the technician gets a piece of it because there will be additional responsibilities. A lot of what happens with that lab space is done after hours because they do immersive hands-on you know, technology stuff. They work on, it could be robotics one week, it could be 3D printing one week. Um, I did get to look at the equipment list and um, our director of integration is very excited um, because some of the equipment is something that we may not be able to fund on our own. Um, we're talking like state-of-the-art 3D printers, stuff that we just probably would not be able to afford with the supports and the, you know, the materials to, to use that moving forward. They'll support it, they'll repair it, and they'll give us the materials moving forward along with the, you know, the curriculum side of it as well. So that was the immersion, I just, uh, I, 
that, not familiar with it, so that, I don't think that ever came. But then you said it was an expansion. So is that it, what the expansion it's, is? It's technically an expansion because they qualified for the grant, but it is a is it's an add-on to the original Vils piece. Um, I do believe four or five Fridays ago we did put yeah. something in, in an email to the school committee, but I can definitely share with you uh, more information through Maria in the Friday email just as a background. It's costing the district zero dollars. They come in and they provide new flooring, they paint the space, they work with Ken and his team to replace lights and or ceilings where needed, and they give us furniture, they give us all of the computers and all of the equipment for the space, and it's all 100% covered by them. Yeah, just my concern is just that it's, everything sounds good, you know, like the original yeah. plan, but now year four, we're gonna pay for all these people. So now on top of the 10 extra positions you're asking for, we're gonna have another eight or whatever of the Vils of six, Eight more positions. So now this is not, it's not no longer 10 positions, it's 20 positions because we have to absorb them. So I think that's important for us to, to know as we go forward. We approve this grant. That's why we're supposed to approve all grants so that we can see what's happening in the future. Uh, you said that they're taking time. When you say it takes time to repair, how much is it? A week, two weeks? Or? So right now with the supply shortages, we can be down a device. And again, it depends on the problem. Right now they're seeing our our technicians report back to the district level, we're seeing problems with keyboards and screens, and it can take anywhere from four to six weeks. If it's a simple problem as far as a battery and or a motherboard component, it actually can be turned around in 72 to 96 hours. The problem is there's no rhyme or reason on how we get a device back. We may send one out for a power issue that comes back in a week, and we may send one out for a screen that we just sent out that comes back in 48 hours, but we sent out three screens the week before that are back ordered four to six weeks. So there's no rhyme or reason there. And unfortunately, on our end, there's nothing we can do to move that process along. The only thing we can do is infuse loaner devices into the buildings. Yeah, it just, it, it seems like there's some, something going on there. The, uh, on your list, you have the high school tech, and I think you mentioned somebody that works in tech, but it's not tech. So like what there's, is that? there's an individual that um, works at the high school um, who, he's kind of a liaison to us. He was hired as a facilitator, but he works on the, on the Durfee side. He does not work on the district level. Um, he's been great with us with the Chromebook program over at the high school. He works with my two technicians daily. Um, and, and, you know, Matt Damaris and or Maria could speak more to the individual, um, but he's not a member of our side. He is a, definitely a Durfee staff member. So you said he was hired as a tech facilitator. Correct. What were the people that are on your on your org charts hired as? Tech facilitators. Right. So why would that be? Um, why I would, wouldn't that individual be on here as the high school? Truth in advertising. That I, question, I was I, I was not the CIO when the individual was brought on. Um, he was brought on, and um, it is my understanding. Um, through discussions with the current superintendent and the principal of Durfee that he is not my staff member, nor does he report to me. He's more of a liaison between the two entities. So he's not a tech facilitator, I guess. Uh, I can answer that, sure. actually. That was, um, that individual was brought on prior to me, but that individual was assigned to Durfee High School, especially with all the um, uh, transition as they were prepared to move, but that person was assigned specifically to the high school. Very good. By, if it doesn't make any sense, why are we still doing it? No, that, that person is productive over there and is a valued member, works with staff and teachers. What we're saying is that person's role is, is what the facilita facilitators are doing, but it is not a district facilitator. Is at the, that person's placed at the high school. So we have other Was facilitators placed. at all other schools? Is that what I'm hearing? We have that facilitator at Durfee High School. That person was placed there. So how many other facilitators do we have at other schools uh, across we, the district? We don't. We, right. they're, they're district, you're, you're right, I, I know what you're saying. What, what I'm telling you is that he has his facilitators that are district employees. That person was brought, brought on, was not, did not, <coughs> uh, was, did not become a district assigned facilitator, <coughs> became a facilitator and was assigned to the high school. I, I, Correct. So let's say that, let's just rewind and say that whoever made that decision at the mm -hmm. time wasn't being thorough, consistent, or anything like that. So they did something that was inconsistent that makes no sense and doesn't fit with everything else. So now we come in, we, you know, we can't keep blaming everybody else. Now we come in, here it is. 
So it, to me, as a member of the committee, it just makes no sense to look at a list that says facilitators across the district, and they don't, you don't have that one on, but then you say, well, the person works at the high school, but they kind of do the job, but they're not. Right? It doesn't make sense. I'm not trying to give you a hard time. It, mm -hmm. just, it just does not make any sense. So it's, it's more of a, I think it's more of a, a mutual agreement between uh, the principal at the high school and the technology staff where um, the individual helps out where needed. Um, he's well versed in what he's doing day to day. He just, you know, there was question of whether or not when we discussed the budget, whether or not he fell under our department and he hasn't. He was under a different uh, line item and he was on the, the high school's budget. So that's where we left it because that's what the principal of the high school requested that he has that individual on a daily because of what he brings to Durfee and his staff. Yeah, I'm not going to belabor the point. I think it's pretty clear that it doesn't make any sense. I'm going to ask the superintendent to just send us any kind of background info relative to when the persons get hired or not so we can actually call truth and advertise. And if the person's a high school facilitator, like everybody else in the district, falls under you as the boss. That's a, to me, that's not that, that much rocket science. The um, maintenance repair, you said that was issues. I've had some concerns. I sent an email last week related to what is the policy <laughs> related to somebody breaks a Chromebook, books, like what, what is the policy on, on so, getting either holding them accountable to it or we just keep on giving stuff out? So when, when you reached out and we had that discussion, I did some research, we did some digging. There are two different policies out there right now. So on the Verizon side, the students and staff, because the staff members get that device as well, sign a contract with Verizon. So theirs are a bit different. Verizon is going to basically repair any device under the program up until the end of the third year. Um, Maria and I did some further research and we did find um, a policy, a digital policy that was created under the former administration that we started to look at. However, I would, um, I would like the opportunity to research that a bit more and then come back to the co uh, committee at a later date where I would like to revamp the Chromebook policy because it is lacking in many, in many areas. And I think that now that we've had some outside discussions and we've also had a chance to look at the current document, um, I think it would be something that would probably behoove all of us as a district to go back to the policy subcommittee and look at possibly cleaning that whole process up where we can have some threshold levels where if a student breaks a device, this is the consequence and so on and so forth because right now it's very vague and buildings are doing different things. There are some buildings that police it very well and there are others that there's some room for improvement. Um, but I, you know, I'd like the opportunity with, you know, with Maria to be able to sit down and come back to the committee with a more concise policy, um, something that's going to cover all areas of the Chromebook with the usage and the student use and, and the staff use because we do have staff damages. Um, but I just feel after looking at the current document that it leaves some area for improvement. So is it, what does it say now if a student breaks the Chromebook? The, the current policy um, uh, reads as um, they lose privileges. So um, it's antiquated. The policy actually needs to go before the, the policy subcommittee to be revised. but there's not um, a monetary uh, attachment to it. So if a student breaks a Chromebook, um, they're given a replacement one or a loaner, but uh, they may lose privileges to attend, you know, uh, extracurriculars, et cetera, but it's not, um, they have to pay $200 towards a new Chromebook or they have to replace it. How about a person that loses a book, $80 book? It's, it, it's actually modeled after that. The, so the current policy is modeled after the textbook. If a, if a student damages a book, damages a, because let's all face it, our uh, Chromebooks and technology is replacing a lot of the hardcover textbooks. And it does, it, it reads as that. That's how um, the, the current policy that we have says that if they damage a book, they're going to be given another book, but they're going to lose privileges, et cetera. There's no monetary value attached to it that they have to pay a certain amount for damaging or losing uh, a textbook, be it a ver uh, electronic or a hard copy. Yeah, so if I could just ask for the data on that, how many over the last couple of years, how many people have lost privileges, how many people have by school, how many devices have been damaged and the like. I just, you, you hear all kinds of different stories, some true, some not true, but we can't have just, you keep on breaking it, like, you know, and just keep on giving them out. If that's happening, that's, un, that's ridiculous. So there has to be some consequences towards, you have to treat this like a, a, a computer, it's your learning tool, 
we shouldn't just be handing them out. That's just, we just don't have that kind of resources. If that's the case, we want to spend millions of dollars and just give them away and let them break them, then so be it. But I don't think that's what anybody wants. Right. So please get the data so we can check it out. My last question is on, you said something about the social sentinel. Yep. Yeah, what is that? Like that's new, you said? It was six years ago and then now, like where so, is? So six years ago, the district, um, they demoed it. It was very, at the time, it was very limited. Um, it was very clunky. Um, They've since merged with other companies. The school committee approved it, I believe, last month. Um, we entered into a one-year contract, and with everything that was going on in some of the buildings and on social media, uh, we jumped at the very discounted price. It would have been probably three times. Um, so we're in the process of onboarding that software now. So basically what would happen is if an individual on Facebook, I'm just going to all fictional, Durfee, gun, Durfee, fight, it would automatically flag it would take a screenshot of, if I made the threat on Facebook, it would take a screenshot of that, and it would send it to the administrator that has access to the system. Currently, right now, we have it set up in demo mode for Maria to have access, myself, and I've also included Mr. Coogan because he's used the software before. It's the intent to be able to roll that down to Director of Guidance, with Drew and his counselors and also the principals, so they just have an, a, a tool that if something's happening on social media, they at least have you know, an idea on what's happening. Um, I've seen the demo, um, Chicago Public Schools started using it and they were actually able to stop quite a few um, events from happening and it made the um, investigation process that much easier for the school admin and the local police department. Yeah, it might be, maybe I just missed it, but did we ever get a presentation on this? Because none of this makes any, it's not ringing a bell that we had any discussion over this issue before, I think maybe it was on was contracts. Was it just a financial piece? Like it was, it was on the contracts and it was approved, and no yeah. one had any questions. That, at that just point. begs it's not your issue, but mm -hmm. uh, it begs the question of what that is, because I would be asking questions like, what is the logistics of it? You I know, can. I mean, I who, can that's also, a lot of pressure for somebody to keep getting these uh, messages and all that. So, I don't recall seeing anything about it, but I could have missed it. Um, can I can you say Mr. Coogan, the HR director, is going to be dealing with this? Well, so he was just, when we were starting the onboard of the software, he was the one at the time when he was the COO of the district. He was very heavily involved in the software, and um, Tom's one of those persons that I can go into his office and bounce ideas off of him. So using the software already, um, I'm just so using... it's a trial. I, I, I thought you were meaning that he's going to be the one no, responsible. Like no, that. he's not. No, not at all. Um, right now, currently, it's Maria or myself, and then we would get the buildings involved, and it's it's our intent to hopefully have someone at the building level also be able to receive these notifications if they're deemed necessary to go out. Um, I can also have, um, I can give you a breakdown of the software and the Friday email through Maria as well, just so you have an idea. Yep. The only other, my last comment is on the sheet that you sent, if you could send us the salary ranges for all of those individuals, because I think it's, um, even before budget time, we currently are existing, so we have resources and I don't want to wait till July 1 if there's needs that we could do now, as well as if, if those people are coming and going and, you know, we have to attract people to our district and you're not going to attract them if we don't pay the requisite amount of money. So when I see those names, I have no idea what they get paid, what they don't, but if you could send that to us via the superintendent, I'd appreciate it. Thank okay. you, Mr. Cabral. I yield. Anything further on this presentation? Okay, thank you. Next item is 11.2. It's you again, Scott. It's a discussion and vote to approve the SIMS data manager job description as presented by Scott Cabral. Um, so I'll be brief because um, we talked about this. We're implementing power schools. It has become a very um, large lift for the district. Um, Mr. Michael Azik and his team are stretched thin already. Um, I was anticipating to be able to bring this position in the new fiscal year. However, the, the demand and the need is now. Um, so we're looking to bring this person on if it's approved, um, hopefully in the next 30 to 40 days. Um, the salary range is attached with the draft job description. Um, and I can answer any questions or Mr. Coogan can answer any questions if that you have. Anybody have any questions? Do we have any of these people in the district right now? This is a new position. Uh, this would be a new position. Okay. Any discussion on that item? Mr. Aguiar. Yeah, I'm just pulling up the uh, list, and uh, I want to say we used to have a position like this in the district. Um, good evening. 
historically, uh, formerly in the Sims department, we had uh, a woman named Miss Landry, and we had three technicians that worked below her to maintain the database under the direction of uh, the coordinator, Mr. Michael Lazik. Um, upon Miss Landry's retirement, we were down to three, and then eventually one of those people took another position elsewhere in the district. So currently we have the coordinator, Mr. Michael Lazik, and two technicians below him. Uh, as a result, um, we're looking at a project where we're going to manage the X2 database and still carry that for a year, in addition to doing all the work of maintaining the power schools uh, database and working on that. So really this position is key to the transition that we're just about to undertake. So we never had a, a, a We had a similar position in uh, Ms. Landry's. This is a little bit more involved than that. It's a little bit of expansion of those duties. Yeah. So when I look at any positions like this, I've asked the same question. It's not going to be a surprise to you. Did you present this to the union? Uh, to the, the teachers union or the administrators union? The administrators union. Not yet, no. Not yet or we're not going to? Not, right. We're not going to. This is, this is not that level of position. Right. So when I look at this stuff, it looks at student information systems data manager. That means you're going to manage something, probably mm -hmm. manage a few people. I've said this in the past. Uh, as far as the union, um, I believe they have either past practice or in writing that if we're going to create any management positions, they're supposed to be brought up to the union uh, to see whether they fit within that union or not. And um, I, would, I would agree with that, Mr. Aguirre, but if I could just hit the pause button there for a second. Th this person manages the database. Mr. Michael Lasik manages those individuals in the department. He supervises them. So he's the actual manager of that department. Right. But all I was asking was if you brought it to them. So if you, if you look at it from their perspective of we you create positions, you ask them, nope, this doesn't fit in the union. Sure. This is an uh, individual contract position. I understand. Okay, yeah, we got that agreement. We move on. We don't have, as a school committee, mm -hmm. to wonder what is, it, like, is this a union? Is it not a union? There's positions in the union that do similar things to these things, you know? So sure, I understand. I, I, it's just being presented to us as, okay, this is what it is. Here's the salary. And it's a, an S non position. I don't oppose the position. It's just I don't know that we did the, the due diligence uh, that we should do. I understand do before. your concern. Uh, like I said, I think the word manager draws your attention to that and the function of some of this stuff. But if you look at the functions within the responsibilities, it's really around managing the database and sort of uh, c creating that structure that allows us to put the, the in correct information into reports for Mr. Michael Lasik or into the reports for the teachers. It's really about managing the database, not the staff. So I certainly will, will um, bring, bring it to the uh, FRAA for their consideration. Yeah, with that I yield, thank you. Anything further? Could I get a motion and a second on this? Motion to approve. Seconded. I have a motion and a second. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. 11.3 <coughs> is a discussion and vote to approve <coughs> the 2022-2023 <coughs> school year instructional calendar as presented by Maria Ponce, Interim Superintendent of Schools. Ms. Ponce. So we have a draft of the new um, uh, calendar, the draft uh, calendar for next year. Um, school year is based on 180 days. Um, we will be returning to school prior to Labor Day once again. August 31st will be the first day, June 15th the last day, barring any snow days. We, if, if we do have the five day inclement weather days, that would be June 23rd dismissal. Um, this, approving this draft calendar <laughs> means that you would be approving uh, the traditional vacation schedules um, as scheduled um, in the past for um, and the end year being June 15th. Any discussion on the calendar? Hearing none, can I get a motion and a second? Second. I need a motion. 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 Oh, I thought you motioned. Oh, Sorry. I have a motion and a second. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agam? Yes. Mr. So Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Item 11.4 <coughs> is a discussion and vote to approve the next steps on the mask mandate as presented again by Maria Ponce, Interim Superintendent of Schools. So as you know, Governor Baker um, and Commissioner Riley uh, held a press conference last week <coughs> that they announced that they would be lifting 
the mask mandate um, as of February 28th. Um, certainly, I think that we can all agree that with the decrease in cases, the time is near for us to lift that mandate. However, given that February 28th is the day that we are scheduled to return from uh, winter recess, uh, we do have some concerns about a potential surge. Um, we returned from Thanksgiving break and saw a little spike. We returned from Christmas break and saw a spike. And um, we're concerned that when we return on February 28th, we will see um, similar data. Assuming that the winter um, recess, you know, children uh, and families travel, they gather with uh, groups, um, so they, um, you know, they are, the exposure is more likely. So um, after consulting with Tess Curran from the Department of Health and Human Services, our own uh, Director of Nursing, Karen Long, um, looking at data and gathering feedback from our unions. Um, we're recommending, recommending that there be a two-week delay to allow for dealing with the potential of a spike. Our recommendation is to lift the mandate for Fall Republic Schools on March 14th. At such time, the parents and adults will determine whether they choose to, um, to wear masks. Of course, any staff, any student who opts to continue to wear masks we encourage them to do so. Those who are high risk and those who are unvaccinated are strongly encouraged um, to continue masking. Um, but one thing to note is that wearing masks on buses is a federal regulation and children will have to continue to wear their mask until that man, uh, regulation is lifted. Um, and as soon as we know that, we will notify families. But um, I would, we are recommending, it's certainly the committee, uh, should be weighing in because that's what um, Commissioner Riley and Governor Baker intended is to leave this to school committees. Um, but our recommendation from the school department would be to do it on March 14th. Any discussion on the mask mandate? Uh, Ms. Rogers, please. So I'm, I'm in agreement with waiting until March 14th, but my question is what happens if we see another increase in cases during that time? What is our plan? Like we're seeing a steady decrease, but our numbers mm -hmm. really look similar to what they did last January. So it's great that we've seen this decrease since Christmas break, but overall they haven't really decreased as a whole, right? We have better plans in place and we have better systems in place, but what is our plan? Should we see those numbers start to increase again during mm -hmm. that two week span? We actually have uh, seen a decrease in numbers. We only had 20 cases last week. Um, every week they've decreased yep. considerably. The city numbers have decreased by about 50%. Um, certainly, I think that um, like all data, we would keep an eye on it and we would have to uh, look at those numbers to see if it was, if we saw a huge spike within the yeah. um, district or within the city, I think we would have to um, have a discussion about whether we uh, continue with the mandate longer mm -hmm. than the 14th. But I think at this time, the, the 14th piece would be to, um, uh, assuming that kids and adults are traveling or, uh, you know, uh, uh, gathering with others, so masking will protect, um, will add a layer of protection for yeah. two weeks so that if there's exposure that we can um, protect. Then I, I think that after that time, we have to um, allow parents and, and staff um, to uh, make those decisions uh, in regards to moving forward. I just want to make sure that we have a plan in place should yep. we see something astronomical happen in well, those two weeks, right? That we can't just say, <laughs> absolutely. well, I, sorry, our mandate's going to end on the 14th and that's going to be the end of it. Because we do have a lot of high-risk kids and staff absolutely. in our district and I want to make sure that we're looking at all of them, not just some of them. Believe me, I'm sick of this. Although in the winter, I got to admit, keep your face a little warm, right? Um, but I want to make sure that we're just being conscientious about that, that we have a plan in place so that way we can move forward. I mean, I think everybody's been very responsive and responsible. Our, our kids really have done an outstanding job. They have. It hasn't been perfect, but they have done an outstanding job, and our staff has done an outstanding job. Uh, families, I think that I, I, no one wants to put people at risk. Mm -hmm. If we saw such a, such a concerning spike, um, upon returning, then certainly I would come back to this committee with those concerns and say, hey, uh, we need to look at this because these numbers are not going in the right direction and we are concerned that we're going to, nobody wants to go backwards, right? Right. Uh, we want to continue to move forward, but um, I, I think we've stabilized and, and I think it's time for us to consider. And that's all I'm asking, so I yield. Thank you. 
Anything else? Uh, Mr. Aguilar? Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey, I saw it. No, no, I was just playing to you. I didn't, no, I didn't think it was in your oh, Okay, about. sorry. The, um, I don't see anything on here related to the number of vaccinations. Do we have that data? Six, um, the city um, is 68% vaccinated, fully vaccinated. I mean, the schools. Schools. So how many adults in the schools, how many students in the schools have been vaccinated, can, fully vaccinated? I can certainly get that data. Usually it's broken down by uh, city uh, data. I don't know if the nurse has asked, has that, the record for, because people don't have to disclose whether they are vaccinated or not. Yeah, well, the reason why I asked that is as we were proceeding over the last several months, the commissioner had indicated if you get to 80% yeah. of the staff, students in the building, they could take the masks off anyway. Mm -hmm. I, you know, personally don't think that we've done enough in this community, in the schools, to encourage the vaccination so that we get the numbers up very high because that's going to help with the, if you take your mask off in the schools, it's going to help the more people we have that are vaccinated. Yeah. It's, the data that I've read or the information that I've read. So we're making this decision, but I don't see anything related to this uh, from the nurse or from, uh, just my thought, Mr. Coogan, I think has a, something okay. to add. Some time ago, we ran a survey. Uh, we, we blasted out over the weekend and we sent it out twice. Uh, participants to all our employees, participants were not allowed to respond twice to the survey. They could only respond once. I want to say the participation rate was above 70 percent, um, which is very good for a survey. And we were in the high 80s on the response rate as being vaccinated. So our adults did a great job of getting out ahead of it. But that was prior to the push to have kids vaccinated and everything else. And that was some time ago. So that number has only risen. Right. So we don't we don't either collect data or collaborate with the city on data for school age children. Well, we do. Um, there is data for a citywide. Um, for, um, but we can't ask parents to tell us or we can't ask our adults to say, are you vaccinated? We can't require that they tell us that. No, I, so 22% I, I, of our children, five through 11, are vaccinated, right? And I think it, that jumps to 58 or 59%, higher. 12 to 17, and then 68% are school. Uh, that's all I was asking. I, that, no, I'm that's, just saying I didn't see it. You know, absolutely. I just think that when we're making a decision like this, we, we need to keep the data in, involved mm -hmm. into why we're making you know, this decision. I'm gonna trust your opinion on, on what you've collaborated with them. Uh, I do agree with Ms. Rodericks that what if the numbers go up, then we'll be scrambling again to, you know, to implement it. But uh, mm -hmm. I just think I would like to encourage everybody to get vaccinated and do the best they can. If we get those numbers really high, we're gonna have less uh, infection in the school. So with that, I yield, thank you. Anything further? Can I make a point about that? Uh, yes, Ms. Rogers. Um, So just about the vaccines and schools and whether or not we're, we're pushing it. I do have to say that I sit on a lot of different committees out in the community, and that is something that consistently gets talked about. And I know that the schools have hosted, well, let me rephrase that. Vaccine clinics have been hosted at the schools. So yeah. community partners have come in and hosted them there to try to encourage families, encourage kids to get vaccinated there. They are not done by the school. There was some misconception about that out in the community. They're done by um, you know the community partners that are doing that. So there has been a big push. Our numbers have, they've slowly crept up in the city, um, which I think has been helpful. But you know I, I agree with you that if our numbers go up, I think we're in better shape, but you know, none of us can obviously control what folks are doing. So we just have to be mindful of the fact that, you know, right. it, this could happen and let's be careful. <clears throat> and I, I just want to be clear that um, if, and if the committee votes to um, rescind or uh, lift the mandate on the 14th, um, again, students who test positive, staff who test positive will have to isolate for five days and they will have to, upon returning, they will have to, that's per Department of Health guidelines, they will have to mask up. I, I understand um, Mr. Aguiar's uh, previous point regarding that. Um, it, it, masks will be required in all the health, all the nurses' office. Students, they will have masks there when they go visit the nurse. They will have to um, uh, mask up when they visit the nurse. Um, and of course, school buses, until that's rescinded, yeah. they will be required to wear masks. Uh, Ms. Pereira? 
Um, so I agree with uh, Mr. Aguiar in regards to data being important in this, but if I'm correct, Superintendent, even if we're using city, citywide data, so we may know this percentage of five to whatever year olds are vaccinated. We don't know what school they go to. Mm -hmm. So even if we had that data, we couldn't safely say, you know, um, Morton Middle School has 70% of their students vaccinated because the, the numbers are overall. So it, that data is almost impossible to get when we're talking about schools, unless it becomes um, a mandated vaccine, which I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get into that discussion, but that's the only way that the school nurse would be able to um, acquire that information from a pediatrician. Otherwise, the information is volatile, like uh, you're volunteering the information. Mm -hmm. So it's, the data is never going to be that accurate, unfortunately, because of the way we're receiving it. You know, and I think um, I agree wholeheartedly with waiting um, a couple of weeks because we do see the increase after um, vacations and holidays where we gather. Um, I think it keeps our, our kids safer and certainly, um, our, you know, as well as our teachers safer. And then going forward, I think encouraging vaccinations and making sure we're encouraging mask wearing for, um, for scholars who um, you know, have medical issues mm -hmm. that it would certainly be more challenging for them if they were to, uh, to get COVID. Um, one thing we can keep track of is who gets COVID. That's right. one thing the nurse can tangibly keep track of. So I feel very confident that a child coming back into school after receiving COVID is going to be required to follow the CDC guidelines with mask wearing and, and, and what have you. So I do agree that data is important. Unfortunately, there's, there's, there's HIPAA laws, and we're not going to be able to get the data that actually tells us how many students are vaccinated from each school. Thank you. I yield. Okay. Thank you. I have a motion and a second. That one, one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Aguilar. Related to issues of now, are we rescinding the policy? Is that what we're doing at this time? Well, um, the policy, the mandate, is being lifted on February 28th. So we can choose to follow what we followed what Desi has done all along right with the commissioner that was a mandate we all had to follow it he is going to lift that on the 28th now in he and he left that up to local control now school committees will have to determine some school committees will decide that they're going to follow along and also rescind and, and lift the policy in their district and others are going to say they might say we're going to keep it for the remainder of the year we're going to keep it for two more weeks um, so we get to determine when we want when we want follow public schools to lift. All right. So, is it here? Is what here? Okay. The policy. So we. So if I'm looking at the information that's presented to the committee. So we got a policy that said it was approved by the committee, and it's up until it's rescinded, the policy's in place. It's in the agenda. So what I'm asking is, are we now therefore taking a vote? to get rid of that entire policy, or has it been reviewed to see these are the policies, parts that we're going to keep, and these are the policies that we're not? Well, what, I don't know if there's been analysis of that before this comes on the agenda. What we were asked to do is, what we're asking you to do is whether we are going to follow the commissioner's, uh, what he's done up until now, which has been, um, we've, we've done exactly what we were doing. We followed what uh, his mandate was and which will be lifted on the 28th, or whether we want to create our own policy and say we're going to do it an additional. We have a mask policy here. We just received today from MASC a uh, mask policy revised um, that we just literally received this afternoon. Certainly we can, um, and, and it states exactly what I just said, the quarantine piece, et cetera. Do we want to, in our piece, when we had our face mask covering, it was the policy was about um, students wearing the mask, right? Because the, the commissioner is the one who, that was the mandate and everybody was required to wear the mask. So we created a policy for face coverings and where they were required and if students, <clears throat> if they had a medical exclusion, et cetera, and when they could wear them when they needed to take them off. We didn't create our own policy because we're following what the mandate of the, of the state. Okay. In the documents that we have before us, it's a, 
There's a document that's called face covering, a.k.a. Yep. mask policy, and it has a whole bunch of things in it. Right. It also says in there at the bottom, it was voted on by the school committee, approved by the Fall River School Committee on August 10th, 2020. That's what I'm referring to, that's all. So right. within that policy, it talks about what do you do with a student, for instance, that doesn't wear one. So this is where it would be a policy that if the child is known by the administration that they need to wear the mask, as we talked about earlier, what is the, what is the, con what is the consequence for that, and what are we, which is embedded within this policy. Right, so, so it I, says unless rescinded by the school committee, right? On there, and you're looking correct. on the second page. Correct. This policy will be in place until rescinded by the school committee. So this body needs to decide whether they want to rescind it on March 14th. So we're just gonna we're gonna say we're getting rid of it. We're not so we're not making that decision today. So I don't know if I'm just. <coughs> I think I think what um, what, uh, what I'm hearing, uh, Mr. Aguiar, is that. That policy, as you're reading it, is in effect until March 14th. And then, as Ms. Rogers pointed out, barring a spike, it's all done on the 14th. The policy goes away. We're just extending, we're all putting a time frame on that policy that says it will end on March 14th. That's what I'm taking from this, but I could be wrong. Is that, am I that right? Was the yeah, that's all we're doing is saying. Right, what I'm uh, just, all I'm asking is, or all I'm stating is that it doesn't say. We're going to take a vote today to rescind the vote of the policy. And within that vote, anything that's within that policy that would help to manage the district moving forward should be addressed on what needs to happen to give the administration guidance on what the penalty for such thing would be. That's, I don't know if it has to be two different things, but if we're being thorough, this, it says next steps. The policy's here. Like, are we getting rid of it? Are we going to tweak it? Yeah. Are we going to put something in place to say now given the, if it's gone, then now we have to have X, Y, and Z because right. it we says in here what happens. A kid goes home if he doesn't wear it, for well, instance. No, I, I, like, I, I agree with you. I think it's the same ride until March 14th. And if, as Ms. Rogers pointed out, something goes wrong in between or the numbers do start to spike, and I've seen enough of this to know that anything's possible, we reactivate it and we go forward again. I think, can I... Add to that, Ms. Ms. Pereira. I think what Mr. Aguirre is, is trying to say: once the, once it, if we vote today to rescind this policy on March 14th, <coughs> this policy that? will be in place until March 14th. Then it will no longer be in place. Right. There will be no repercussions for children who are not wearing masks because they won't be required to wear them. Now, the only time they would is if they come back from having COVID, in which case that's a policy, a health policy which is still in place, and that's not going to change. Am I correct, Superintendent? Mm -hmm. So we already have a policy through health that deals with um, students or faculty who get COVID and then are required to wear, um, to mask up in schools five days or what have you, um, which is separate from this policy. So if we vote today to rescind this policy, we're saying we're going to keep it till March 14th, after March 14th, it's done. So there will, no, there will be no repercussions. It'll be optional. So we're gonna encourage students um, and, and let parents make the choices for their, for their children and educators make the choices for themselves as to um, if they wanna mask up because they are um, in a high risk you know, category. But it's an optional thing. So it's not gonna, we don't need a policy related to repercussion. I don't know, does that make more sense? I, I think, hold on. I think that's I think that's what I'm reading too. Yeah. Um, Mr. Hart. Yeah. No, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I yeah I I, use, uh, I absolutely agree with um, Committee Woman Pereira. Uh, I, and I think too that this I, I I'm glad that that the superintendent uh, extended for March 14th. I think that works. We've seen a spike, like you said, in uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I also agree with Ms. Rodericks uh, for bringing that point up. I think it's a valid, very valid point, and it's happened in the past to us. So, um, and, and I also too think that the, uh, the, the like what Ms. Pereira said, that it, it needs to be back in, the decision, decision process needs to be back with the, with the parents in the household. And I think that that's, that's where it should be and that's where it should stay. Um, I do think that, uh, as Mr. Agia said, that people should encourage them to be, get vaccinated. Um, and I also believe that, um, if people, like, like you said, Superintendent, if they want to wear the mask, they wear the mask. If they don't, they don't have to. 
So I think this is a very good, uh, you know, this makes a lot of sense to me, and I think it makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. So I, I'm, I'm happy to uh, approve it. Uh, Mr. Bailey. Um, I agree with the, uh, uh, with the March 14th um, date as well. Uh, one question I just asked, uh, I want to ask is with the testing program, um, where, are we gonna, where, where do we stand with that? The what? The, test and stay. The test and stay. We, didn't, we, um, we are not doing test and stay anymore. We are doing the at-home testing. When we picked up at-home testing for staff and students, we, um, did, we stopped doing test and stay. That was one of the conditions for that at-home testing made available. It was, we are still doing symptomatic testing and um, at-home testing. Uh, if I can just, we are scheduled to meet on March 14th. That will be our next meeting. Certainly we can look at numbers at that time. I do think that um, we could bring back, Mr. Aguiar brings a good point, whereas if we, um, let's say we have students who are quarantining, uh, who are isolating for five days and then have to wear a mask for additional five days, we do need to have something in place that we can hold um, you know, uh, them accountable for. Um, also, we do need to put in writing that masking needs to happen in school offices. So perhaps what we need to do is look at this one and just look at the MASC policy that we just received this afternoon, incorporate those pieces and just uh, um, you know, uh, modify that and just have a very short piece. So in cases where we have students who test positive or staff who test positive, they're required to do this, this, and this, and we could bring it for the May, uh, March 14th <clears throat> so meeting. So do you want to table this till March 14th and, um, and with, well, the, with an eye towards masks that are coming off March 14th unless unforeseen things happen? I think there's two things. Go ahead. So we, you could vote that we are going to um, lift the mask mandate on the 14th, pending data, and then we would also could uh, bring forward. a revised yeah. policy to enact uh, moving forward from the 14th. There, there is a because motion right now a we have this. The yeah, there's a motion and a second no, on the first. Oh, no. There isn't. No, there isn't. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, I might make a motion. All right, all right, I have a motion. Oh, yeah. I have a second. I have a motion and a second, Mr. Aguilar. Yeah. This just points to just being thorough and reviewing the information before it gets submitted to the school committee. That's all I'm saying. I'm not in disagreement with people over what it needs to happen or not. But if I'm looking at this document here, I'm looking at what was sent to us as part of the backup documentation for this meeting. Nowhere in any of this literature does it say the recommendation of the administration is to rescind the policy. Nowhere in there it says we're going to create a new policy. I agree with what Mrs. Pont says now. I think we need to go back and make sure that whatever needs to be in the policy, we have it for the next meeting. So that will give guidance to the principals and administrators about what happens if a child is under X, Y, and Z circumstances. That's all I'm saying. We just ha didn't do a thorough enough job of presenting what it is here. Well, so I, I'm not trying to say let's wait till the 14th. Yeah. What I'm saying is we have to at some point, because the policy is in place, we have to have the language. The school committee votes to rescind the policy, change the policy to now only have that one paragraph, as Mrs. Pont said. So. I, that's all I was trying to make a point. It wasn't here. I'm glad it's going to be here, and we can move on. All right, so I, I say we vote on um, the res, rescinding the uh, mask mandate as of the 14th <clears throat> with the, with the uh, modifications coming forward also at the 14th and with an eye towards what Ms. Rogers pointed out about any fluctuations in the data. I um, have Deb one other oh. Go ahead. Just to clarify Mr. Uh, Bailey's question, so we're continuing with the testing program as we have it now, where <coughs> students are Symptom taking home um, yes. taking home tests on a biweekly basis. Yes, we will. Okay. We're continuing with at-home testing and symptomatic testing. Okay. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Iger? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Laravy? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Can I just ask a clarifying question on Ms. Roderick's comment there? So her question was about whether we're doing student testing and then it, the answer back was uh, symptomatic. Like, can you just explain what that yep. is going forward? Sure, symptomatic testing we've been doing all along and last year we did it. That's for any students or staff who exhibit symptoms while in school. They go to the nurse, the nurse does uh, test them and if they test positive, they're sent home to isolate. Um, the at-home testing, 
which uh, I brought before the committee last month. Um, the governor and the commissioner made available at-home test kits for students and staff. They pick up um, any parent who's opted into that. They have to have a consent form. And if they do, they weekly, they, every other week, because a box contains two tests, they receive a test. They can test themselves at home. If they're positive, they report it to the nurse. So those, that's the, the two um, testing programs we have in place. And then we explored the test and stay, but that never went we anywhere. We did test and stay for a short time. Um, that was only for, the test and stay was only for students and staff who were deemed close contacts while in school. That reach was very small, so we wanted to expand that reach to all of our families and students. Yes, yeah, so that's no longer it. And that's no said. longer. With that, I yield. Thank you. Okay. Well set. Next item up is 11.5, which is a discussion and vote to approve the spending of $591,372 the City Council approved as presented by Maria Ponce, Interim Superintendent of Schools. This, this actually was, if you recall, this um, went back to the subcommittee, uh, instructional subcommittee, um, where we reviewed um, the, uh, what the money, uh, the appropriation was going to be targeting. It, it is for supplemental materials for um, uh, earmarked for uh, special needs uh, teachers as well as um, uh, ESL teachers who uh, typically were sharing materials as well as classroom libraries. It's part of our Wonders core curriculum in grades pre-K to five. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor? Can I get a motion? Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Aguilar. Just wanted to clarify. I know at the subcommittee we asked this to come back and then we um, I believe I asked at the meeting, but I don't see it in the writing here for the edification of the members that this is actually materials. It's not curriculum because it was confusing to me that it was curriculum like we're adding another. So we already right. went down that road, right. right, wrong or indifferent a couple years ago. So this is basically for actually hard yes. materials, like buying textbooks for the teachers and the Absolutely. staff so they can service various students. So this isn't curriculum per se. Now, I, th I do think, and it's still, I think, outstanding, that we have some needs about figuring out how much curriculum, what's being used, what's not. We've talked about that in the past. Mm -hmm. It's high time that we actually get all of that data so that we can figure out what we're using and what we're not using. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to make the committee aware that we did vet this, and it was for materials. Subsequently, I you know, found out from uh, different places that the Wonders curriculum might not be the best uh, advised uh, curriculum so I think some of that information probably could be taken offline but we had gone through a couple of years ago this is only for materials so that's why I'm much easier to support this because it's a supplement to what we already did it's not going right. down a curriculum road where we would have to analyze the benefits of it right I, I it is part of wonders curriculum though which is what we use that I mean I, I I know that you have information. We certainly, I'm willing to, uh, I know Stephanie's here and Dr. Curley, we can sit down and go over. Wonders is actually um, a high quality curriculum that is that was vetted through Ed Reports um, and Desi. So we certainly can sit down and go over um, uh, its, its use. Thank you, Ariel. Discussion? Do I have a motion to second that? No. Can I get a motion? So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yeah. Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. <laughs> Mayor Coogan? Yes. 11.6 is a discussion and vote to approve a job description for the site facilitator for programming and operations at Durfee High School as presented by Matt Damaris, Durfee High School principal, and Tom Coogan, human resource director. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, this position is something that we've discussed for a few years now. Uh, it, the conversation emerged uh, in April of 2020, and then over the course of the next year, um, we put it into the budget coming into this year. And the reason uh, why there was a year gap between the conversation and implementation is last year, with our hybrid model and a lot of remote action, we ran very little after school programming. We were in a phase of moving out of that school, so not a lot was going on after school. Now we're in the new building, and it's beautiful. You've all been there, you've seen it. Those of you who haven't, I think you've all been there, right? Um, 
it needs to be used. It needs to be used longer than the confines of a school day. And when you push your operations into the later afternoon and then hopefully into the evening and beyond, we're going to need people there that are going to be able to, to handle situations and to keep an eye on things in a supervisory way um, that, that they have a background in education and how schools run, um, kind of like a second shift concept. So what we put after discussion with the committee recently across the fall, we put forward this what you have in front of you tonight as a job description for a site facilitator for programming and operations. So I'm here to answer any questions, um, and I hope you consider it in a favorable way. Any questions for the site facilitator at Durfee? Uh, Mr. Aguilar? Yeah, so the only, uh, I mean, I think there's a need for it. We talked about it in the past. My concern is the, and I asked this question of the other position relative to the union. And when I see language such as, please review the job description with the lens in mind. We have removed administrative language and duties related to FRAA administrative functions, and there was no administrative license for the position. If I'm reading that, I'm only saying that this has been tweaked so that it doesn't fall under the union, which I don't necessarily uh, agree or like that uh, particular piece. I would also argue with the case that this position needs to have some authority if you're involved in the supervising after school of the credit recovery programs and the like they they can't remove all administrative functions because it's actually supervising a lot of different programs as mr damaris said if the school is going to be used for a variety of reasons the person has to have some some authority and some teeth so uh, I, that I, doesn't jive with the fact of well, well I, I think the earlier version that was um, uh, brought forward um, had a little bit heavier administrative function. In my conversations with the FRAA, and I did discuss this uh, particular job description with them, uh, and I told them that I would be bringing it before the committee um, tonight, um, I spoke with them, and given um, the similarity <coughs> of this position to the positions that we use in some of our summer programs uh, for site facilitators, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with some of the people that we use in the summer over at the high school. Uh, there's, there's several individuals involved in that. That the, the, the focus was more around that than in being an, an evaluator or somebody who's uh, uh, dealing with all of the conduct issues or any of those type things. So it was less of that vice principal type function and more of a site facilitator where when the person runs across one of those situations that really calls for the administrative function, then they loop in either a VP that's on, on call or uh, Mr. Damaris to make a ruling on that and, and to get instructions on how to proceed. Um, it's also calls for somebody who's more familiar with how a school runs and those functions and where to go and where not to go. Um, and in keeping with the committee's feedback on the original uh, proposed modified shift position, um, this was less of an administrative function with less of a, a administrative price tag attached to it and more of a site facilitator, manager, uh, operations facilitator while they did those functions and handed it off to somebody if it mm -hmm. became an administrative issue. Yeah, uh, I mean, That's what they want. look at the salary. The salary is, is actually potentially could be more than some of the administrators we have in the administrators union. So I'm not sure that that flies with the face of uh, well, one of the things to consider. One of the things to consider is that if it were a teacher that applied for the position as opposed to an administrator that might you know, be, be interested in this. This, the second shift piece may not be as attractive. You're going to ask them to work a, a, a day that goes longer into the night, more days in the school year than, a, than a, uh, a, a teacher's position. So it's probably going to be, if it were a teacher, it's probably going to have to be a little bit more than the teacher was making in their regular 183-day schedule and, a little, and accommodating for a little bit for the, for the later shift in the day. So, so the range is wide to, to, to try to accommodate that. Yep. Do you have a, anything in writing from the union that they would not oppose this? No, because they have not seen all the elements of this yet. Um, I explained that when I spoke with them, and he said, have your conversation with the school committee and bring it back to us on uh, And then on no Monday. weigh in on it? Yeah. Yeah, if you could just send that to the committee after. Sure. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, do we have a motion to second them? No, we do not. Uh, uh, can I get a motion? So a, moved. A, a motion. Seconded. I have a motion to second. Uh, Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rogers? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. 
Item number 11.7 is a discussion and vote to approve the facility school use as referred by the Facilities and Operations Subcommittee and presented by Ken Pacheco, Chief Operating Officer. Hello, everyone. The um, subcommittee quite a while back voted to um, set up uh, a new matrix um, with a percentage increase of about 20 to 25 percent across the board for use of any of our facilities. So this matrix includes everything that we currently have um, and then uh, upgraded uh, the high school to reflect the new uh, numbers in the new areas uh, which are uh, rentable, so to speak. It also includes the new uh, baseball field. So there are items, as I highlighted in the letter, um, that are not on this list and will wait until uh, those facilities are built. So the committee always has the option um, when someone <coughs> uh, chooses to rent the place uh, or a particular uh, field or, or uh, building to, um, if they don't like the rates, you know, uh, if they feel the rates are um, going to hurt the organization in any way, um, then they have the right to come to the committee. Um, but those decisions would be made here. They wouldn't be made at facilities. So uh, when someone calls to rent, we look in which column they fit into, and that's the price based on uh, the usage and the amount of personnel required to run that particular event. Any further questions? I have a question. Uh, Ms. Rodgers? Well, it's, it's less a question and just more of a, a comment. So when we're looking at the nonprofit cost, so that's per hour yes. for the use of those facilities. So just as a nonprofit, that's going to price a lot of folks out so I want to make sure that we have some kind of plan in place, especially if we have nonprofits that are supporting the kids that are in our schools, that we have a plan in place to be able to work with them because this, that, that's going to price a lot of folks out. So all of these numbers have been in existence. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if a room was $40, there's a 25% increase to that $40. Currently, they're paying $40. There are conditions where these have been waived. Um, because of historical data that they've been waived before. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is, is that we would like this to go in effect on July 1, and that we would not have the ability to waive anything. That if someone needs to um, deviate from this list, then they need to come to the school committee to state that case. Okay. And the reason why I say this is because everything that we do with our buildings eventually has to be repaired. Every, every rental, um, including our own uh, you know, our own functions and the wear and tear on the particular facility, the custodial cost, the security cost, um, it, it comes with a price mm -hmm. that, that sometimes uh, we overlook. We're, we're spending millions of dollars on athletic fields and those athletic fields um, are going to need new carpets. Mm -hmm. We currently don't have any funds available to replace those carpets. This would allow for those funds to be kept into that account, and after the personnel fees are paid, those funds left over would take care of this. For instance, Cuss needed new carpeting in the auditorium, the most used auditorium in the district. Those carpets were replaced using this fund. Again, um, the library again for in this building, those carpets need replacing a, a school use um, eligible fund. So what I'm looking to do is to take the arbitrary fees uh, waiving away from us and, and put it here where it belongs. Um, and then any organization can come here, state their case. If that's the case, then that's fine. We didn't do it. Um, and an organization basically needs the next organization with a similar operation would know that it didn't it needs to go through the process. No, I'm all for creating a system to deal with that process. I just want to make sure that we're just mindful and being good community collaborators by acknowledging the fact that that will 
price out a lot of folks and that they are aware that they can come to the committee and ask that question. That's my only, sure. you know, just looking out for our community partners. I yield. Yes. Mr. Agio. So the, uh, I recall this being, we were talking about youth football a year ago, I think at the last budget or something like that over in the. Yes. Did nothing, did anything happen to that? Or was that just, was that just, did they pay? Did they not pay? Uh, I don't think we've ever heard anything since that. Discussion. So they, they've paid their regular fees. What they were looking for was those fees to be reduced. The, those fees were not reduced. The fees that they were paying were paid. Um, and the other groups that rent the artificial turf fields pay the same rent. So, I don't know, maybe, maybe I, I'm missing it or something, but I recall, and maybe we could do some research on this, we go back to the room over there, we were meeting in, during COVID. It was stated that we, we as a committee were not gonna approve these, but we wanted those nonprofits to be able to use the outdoor facility for free. With, uh, I think, uh, paying for the port of john or something along those lines. That was the, that was the natural fields. That's the natural turf fields, right. So that, if that's what this committee would like to see, then that, that can happen. I, again, I don't have the same cost on, the, on a natural grass field other than the Porter Johns. Anybody who's renting a field needs the Porter Johns available because the buildings are not going to be available for them to use. So that is part of. No, I get it. I was just trying to figure out back what happened since that meeting. And when I, that's why I was asking. There was a facility meeting that we went over all of these numbers. And again, at the facilities meeting, these, the 25% was approved so that we could set this matrix. If the committee does not want anyone to pay for the use of those fields, for instance, we don't have a lot of grass fields, we only have a few, um, but um, the easiest one would be Fonseca. We have a, a, a little league field, softball field at that school. So it's a grass field. If, uh, if the um, Columbus Little League, which used that field for years, wants to use that field, they can the only thing they have to do is come up with the Porter Johns, pay for the Porter Johns, and they can use that field yeah, by I'm permit. Just, I, I hear you. All right. I'm asking is if somebody can get us what happened after that meeting. So the, the subcommittee voted, and then it came to the full committee. We said no as a full body. So at that time, I don't believe we've ever heard anything back to say Pop 1 is not paying. Pop 1 had to pay the old rate. Pop one had to, I haven't heard anything Pop about Pop one paid the bills that they needed to pay because the committee didn't act on a freebie. So they did pay. They, there's no change in, in what they were paying. The only, the only issue is, is right now, with this document, there is a change. So my guess is, is that they will be here, along with other groups, looking for relief from the new fee. Yep. Mrs. Yes. Ponce, may I just please ask that you go back and review the records. It was not... I can tell you from my, my angle, it was not the impression of just let it be. Please go back and review what happened, because I think we should have had this back before us long ago, rather than February 14th, 2022. And they shouldn't have been paying, as far as I'm concerned, because my vote would have been as such. And I don't think that we, we haven't heard anything for a long time on this. So if you could please just review it. I don't, I agree with Mrs. Rogers. I think some of the Nonprofits, if we're not having an expense like on an outdoor field, we shouldn't be trying to make money on our community use. Uh, likewise, if a nonprofit wants to come in and work with a school to say, while well, we have custodians in the building and there's not going to be an expense, why would they not be able to come in and run a, uh, a meeting or whatever else? Like, so I think there's some intricacies to this that, mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to let people say that we don't want them to use it. But if you could please get back to us on what happened with that since that pop one vote. With that, I yield. Thank you. All right, so any further discussion? Um, Ms. Larvey? Yeah, hi, Kenny. Just could you, right off the top of your head, do you know how many community uh, partners, people use our fields? Nonprofits? Nonprofits. Um, Papa Warner comes to mind um, at Henry Lord and use the uh, stadium. Um, I don't know of too many others. Right. Uh, and, and, I, and I do say Columbus uses uh, that uh, field, Fonseca. but they didn't use it last year or the year mm -hmm. before. So I think, uh, Mr. Aguiar, this does go back to that, that meeting that we were discussing, right. the nonprofit and how, the, how it was very, uh, 
it was kind of unfair because these these kids, 85% of them are a Fall River Public School kids. And I think the both of us kind of advocating for these kids and going back to that meeting, um, I do recall that it was supposed to come back to us. I, I guess conversations were supposed to happen between Pop Warner and I guess you and your team, uh, and that didn't happen. But so I, I guess what I'm saying is, is we're going to go by this rubric and they're going to have an issue and they're going to come in front of us. And I guess the decision is going to have to be made then. Correct? Is that well, what, is I, that I how would, we're leaving I would hope this that for, for season 2022? I would hope that all the decisions are made on a one on basis. Right. So, so if anyone wants not to pay for a particular field mm -hmm. or a particular room, it should be that one person, that one time. Yep. Because if it's going to be permanent, then that's fine right. as long as it's... Right. So we can add it to this matrix so that my people are not having to decide. Okay, it shouldn't be okay. a decision that we're making. It's not a decision that I should be making on my level. Mm -hmm. This is the only level things like that should happen. Mm -hmm. So if a, if a community want, a community partner would like to use the facility, whether it's indoor, outdoor, it should come here as a one-off, get it approved, and then and then be done. So that's how I think it's the it's the cleanest way. No other way is going to. Um, each each group is unique, in what they what they use, Absolutely. how much they want to use, how how often they want to use it, mm -hmm. and I think it would be much easier for mm -hmm. for it to happen that way than any other way. Right, and and we can go back and forth, and the, the wear and tear from Pop Warner is is much higher than any other people, I guess, rentals. But um, as far as what I don't see on here is the uh, concession stand. Is that not an option for anybody? I don't, I don't believe that we have a way to um, have anyone but the school operate the concession stand. I think it's, um, it's very complicated. It becomes um, a situation where it's never without question. Mm -hmm. um, when it's being used, and we always have complaints on the school side mm -hmm. after an event. Okay. So we, I think personally that you, the heart of most organizations is that concession money, mm -hmm. and I think they should be allowed to do that. I just don't think that the building itself, the concession stand itself, the equipment in the concession stand, with the exception of any equipment that was shared, and was bought that way mm -hmm. um, should be used by outside right. agencies right. because of just what I just said. This it's always an issue. So the bathrooms are available to outside agencies, um, and the equipment that was purchased by both sides is always set up outside of the con particular concession stand. Mm -hmm. So that wouldn't change, and I wouldn't be opposed from where I stand um, to allowing a space to store that stuff but just not the concession stand itself. I think it's the cleanest way to avoid pointing the finger at this group can use it, that one can't. Mm -hmm. And that's where the stuff, the, the arguments usually happen. Thank you, I yield. Anything further, Mr. Aguio? Just based on your answer, you said that you think that the uh, schools are in charge of the uh, buildings and the uh, concession. Are you accurate in that? Say that again, I'm sorry. You had mentioned to Ms. Larravee that you felt that the schools only should be the ones using the concessions within the The concessions the buildings, stand. The buildings. The building itself, yes. Right. So I think we have an issue going on at the high school where that's not the case. It isn't. It isn't. That's why I'm saying to you I think that that's the way it should be. Because... The, I don't, the, I'm not disagreeing with you. What yeah. I'm saying is, though, I think by this, we got this policy here. Separate from that, we have an issue going on that's been going on for way too long related to too many side deals and uh, this one said that they could use it and that one and this and that, the advertising, big mess. But I agree with you, the high school. So that's the high school administration has to manage their building. That's no, not the I think that's community. a building and ground situation. I don't think that the high school is, is totally, that's the electrical system for the school. There's, there's a lot going on in that concession stand. That right now is, is actually a hub of, of all of the electrical for the fields. 
and not just the lighting, but all of the electrical for the fields, some parking lot lighting, the generator. There's a lot that that concession stand has turned into with the new construction. So it, it is not just a school functional building. It is now buildings and grounds. That, that building needs to be secure. But it's not and school committees, my, was my point. The nope. use is. No one, no one should be saying that it's a school committee's vote whether the boosters use it or not use it. Like that's, that's an administrative function of, okay. you know what I'm saying? Like I, that's my point, okay. is that I think people need to get to the bottom of what they do, what they don't do, and the administration needs to say, this is what happened, you know what I mean? We, we get too many calls for the complaints, in my opinion, over a Friday later being broken, or this was a mess, or that was a mess, like that. I think that's some sort of under the hierarchy figure it out. As I said, it's historical because there's an awful lot of, of stuff that was done and was said to be done by different groups and, and, and it's very difficult by, to... I agree to, with Ms. Pacheco. I always go by, show me the letter in writing that says where this happened or that happened. Yeah. You know, we've had advertising issues, the same thing. That's been several years. I still can't get answers on some of those questions. So let's get everything in writing so we're all on the same page. This is what it is and let the administration work on it. With that, <clears> I yield. Mr. Hart? Uh, Ken, you, you said uh, did last year with the uh, Falcons, did, or Pop Warner and other nonprofits, did they use this, this yes, they did. last year? Okay, yes, they so did. You're so the changes, the changes are going to be made is there will be a storage area yep. um, that will only allow them to store items in that particular area. As I said, the building has become much more um, secure, yep. and it needs to be because there's a lot of sensitive equipment to operate. Uh, buildings and generators and, and lighting um, that we just can't have everybody in the building. And the thing is, even even sometimes on our end, but we, we need to be sure whoever is in the building is going to take responsibility for the building. Right. As I said, because even if it's our own people, there's a lot in there, a lot going on in that building, and we don't need to have an accident happen. Um, you know, with somebody getting hurt or a piece of equipment getting destroyed, because we didn't know who was in our building. And have you formally uh, recommended uh, that yet? To We're going to build that particular I mean, area. They know, they know now. No, no. Right. Well, it, it was, I think everybody knew it was coming. Right. Um, that's no surprise. But I, I think the this, once that building is secure and we can allow that other group or groups to use that particular area for storage, um, locks will be changed and um, that'll be the end of the story. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield. Okay. Do I have a motion and second on that? No. Can I get a motion? Miss... One more question. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, As I'm going through this agenda, I see a lot of things that are coming up for the first time. Did we eliminate the first read of things? So in the past, like over the, we've always had like first read of this so we can make motions, then digest it over a month, and then come back unless it was urgent. But I don't see that listed anywhere here. So there's no policy coming before you. Are you? What are you? What are you referring to? I'm, what I'm referring to is the, to. You're talking about the facilities. Voting to approve stuff. like new policies, new uh, numbers here with the um, what Mr. Pacheco just presented. Uh, the next one is about a, a whole new committee. Well, like we're we're actually tabling that because the committee is not moving that forward right now. All right, I'm just going by the agenda. That's mm -hmm. all I can go by. Right. But I, I think that if we. Uh, I think we should take some time. You know, I haven't been able to watch the meeting, as I said earlier, but uh, I don't necessarily think this is an urgent item. I'd rather not vote against it, but I think that if we're going to just implement these things with some fees in here, I haven't done enough um, investigating to figure out whether I'm for it or not. So it's up to you. you vote on it. I'll just vote no. But just so we're clear, though, that was referred at a previous meeting, not at today's facilities meeting. Yeah, that the one about a year and a half ago, yeah. The one before. Okay. So yeah. that piece that you're talking about was from a previous meeting, not from today's Correct. facilities okay. meeting. Do I have, I have a motion and a second? Deb? No, I don't have, I don't have anything. Can motion I a motion to the table. Yep. Somebody make a motion? Yeah. I didn't hear. Did somebody make a motion? That's a no. Motion to table. I I said so. made a motion oh, to table. Paul made a motion, I'm sorry, <laughs> and, and, so moved. and Mimi seconded it. So Deb, is there a call? motion to table? I'm sorry, I'm having no, a hard time. I, I, no, so okay. yeah. I believe that, the motion to table the motion take, first. I'm sorry. Right, and where does the motion to table take precedent? It does. 
All right. Do I have a second on the motion to table? Is, uh, can I ask a question? Go ahead. Yes, of course, of course. Is it that you need more time to look through this, Kevin? You asking me? Yes, I'm asking yeah. why you're tabling it. Yeah, so my motion to table is just based on the fact of we bring up some issues here that I'd be much more comfortable if it was an all-encompassing policy about how the nonprofits would be treated and the like. So it's basically just for more info. This is policy, if we read it, is going to be in implemented July 1. So it's not like it's going to be implemented next month. So my only rationale for tabling it was so that between meetings now that we brought up some things today, we can get some answers from the administration and then take a vote where maybe we all solidly in agreement on the pieces that need to be here. That's all. Okay. That's fine. Second it. I have a motion to second. Deb, call the roll. Ms. Dragia. Yes. Ms. Bailey. Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Laravy? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes. Okay, item number eight, 11.8. Um, I've been instructed that we're, we're, I'm asking for a motion to table. Uh, we're not prepared to go forward with this at this time. Can I get a motion to table? So moved. I got a motion. Second. A motion to second. Deb, please call the roll. Ms. Dragia? Just a. Um, uh, procedural question this was going to be from the referral and I guess that never happened so doesn't it just die like it, we, we wouldn't be tabling it here it's actually probably tabled in the subcommittee I'm guessing I don't know how, what the subcommittee did but if they tabled it in subcommittee we didn't, we didn't make a motion on it we just we didn't table so, it. so it shouldn't even be here because it would have to go before a subcommittee first well it's on the it's, it's on it, the it's on the agenda so it, it just, did go before the subcommittee but it, we weren't the committee, the committee gave feedback that they wanted us to go back and, and make some. Correct. So it's going to go back to that subcommittee. Right. Yes. Correct. It's not coming Absolutely. back here. Yes. Correct. So no, that's my point. We, so we basically want to delete this instead of. Recommit to the subcommittee. That's what it'll be. It won't be. Um, I'm sorry. Mo motion to recommit to the subcommittee. Re motion to recommit to the subcommittee. She seconded. Second. Uh, second. Can discussion? Deb, call the roll. Mr. Agam? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Larvey? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes. 11.9 is a discussion and vote to approve the statement of interest in accelerated repair project on the Wiley School as referred by the Facilities and Operations Subcommittee and presented by Ken Pacheco, Chief Operating Officer. Make a motion. I have a motion. Second it. And I have a second. I have to read Mr. Pacheco. Okay. So uh, this is the second time that this particular item has been before the committee. Um, was in early 19, um, the submission went into MSBA. It was going to go into MSBA. Um, and then um, we uh, decided that it wasn't the right time, um, that we were uh, concerned on the city side about funding to uh, carry the project out, and it never made it past uh, the committee. So again, in 20, we tried. Um, COVID stopped us at that point. Uh, MSBA did not move forward with any uh, of the uh, ARP programs, which is the Accelerated Repair Program. So what this request is, is a redo, um, looking to put a roof, new boilers, and um, windows in the Wiley School. And the thought process is, uh, that this school would be used for expansion of the Stone School um, and give us some swing space um, where not at capacity yet, but we will be, um, we could be at any point. And this would allow us to either separate the younger students and move them to um, the Wiley School as an annex or um, to uh, figure out what other use that this would work well with with the Westall. Uh, and the um, and stone um, at Westall. So the, the, the process is um, this committee, this body uh, needs to um, vote on this if they want this to happen. And then um, I would go to city council next week. Uh, the February uh, calendar is really different at the city council uh, because of two meetings being together. So I would uh, bring this to city council uh, and then the submission date is um, mid to late March. Um, to MSBA. 
So the process is they need the two governing bodies to vote before this would move on to them. It's an 80-20 split on all ARP projects, so everything that's eligible is a straight 80-20 split. Um, Tansy was the best example. It was a small amount of money that the city had paid on their side of the, um, outside of, of uh, their 20%, uh, as opposed to a Westall, which had a lot of ineligible costs, um, ADA compliance, and, and things like that. This project here is straight windows, doors, and uh, boilers. Um, and will not have the same issues because we will do as we did for um, the Watson and um, get a waiver on the ADA since the school will not, we're not going to be looking for immediate occupancy. Any discussion on the Wiley? Mr. Aguilar. So when uh, I want to say we approved something on, I don't know if this was it or not, but at the time it was a small school and I believe I had asked the question of if we were ever going to occupy, we had to do full handicap accessible accessibility to it, which was a big number, a price tag. And yes. that would have been at our or the city's uh, expense. And, it's, and it still will be. It still will be. The issue is, is we're losing the building because of the roof leaks, um, because we don't have the ability to heat that building. And once we, not, we, we stop heating buildings, a lot of things happen, you know, paint peels, Door walls crack, things like that. So what I'm trying to do is salvage the building, put a roof on it, um, and if I can do a full ARP, then it is only a two-story building, so the elevator is not quite expensive. It's a two-story building, so the fire suppression is not as big a number as Westall, um, and the um, site is a, a different kind of site than Westall was, so there's quite a few differences square footage-wise. It's a huge difference. It's half the size of... Um, I'm sorry, I keep saying Westall, it's Watson. Half the size of Watson. So have you talked to the city about the, whether they want to pay for this? Is I have not. I will be talking to the city when I go down to the city council. Uh, this is going to go from here to the mayor's office, and the mayor will need to send it down. If the mayor does not want to send it down, then, um, then it won't go anywhere. So if this isn't to. binding it, what I'm saying. What, We're not binding what you, ourselves. You're anything. not binding anything. No. We're just going to try to get the money, and then they're going to and this is no And this is no money, so this is strictly a statement of interest. If we get chosen, then we get invited to the next round, which is feasibility, which costs 250000 of which 50000 will be on us. And then you move into the funding round right after that. Yeah, if you could just please report back to the committee how that discussion with the sure, city goes. I Thank will. you. I yield. Okay. Do I have a motion to second on that? I have a motion by Ms. Larravee. Second. Okay, I have a motion to second. Uh, Deb, please call the roll. Ms. Larravee needs to read. I have to read certain language. Mayor Coogan. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay, resolved. Having convened an open meeting on February 14, 2022, prior to the closing date, the school committee, the uh, city of Fall River, in accordance with its charter <coughs> bylaws, and ordinances has voted to authorize the superintendent to submit the Massachusetts School Building Authority, the statement of interest form dated March 25th, 2022, for the William J. Wiley School, located at 2585 North Main Street, which, which describes and explains the following deficiencies in the property categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in the future replacement, renovation, and modernization of school systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating, and ventilation systems to increase energy conservation and decrease energy-related costs in school facility. This project will be for a request of a new roof, two boilers, and complete window and door replacement and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits sit the city, town, regional, school, district to file an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Thank you, Ms. Larvey. Can we get a vote? Mr. Agio? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larvey? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rogers? Yes. Mayor Cooley? Yes. 1110 is 
Very similar, it's a discussion and vote to approve a statement of interest in accelerated repair project on the Robert L. Madeiras Resiliency Preparatory Academy as referred by the Facilities and Operations Subcommittee and presented by Ken Pacheco, Chief Operating Officer. So this project is, again, an, um, an accelerated repair project. Uh, we just finished one at, um, at the school, and it was a new roof, five new roofs, actually, um, on that building at 290 Rock, and uh, new boilers. So because of the size of the project, putting the windows in with that project um, would have really had, uh, we would have really had a difficult time trying to operate that building and keeping it live. Too much going on um, as it was with the roof and the boilers, um, adding the windows to it. There's 390 windows in that building, um, so that project is a very long and, and um, extensive uh, construction project to try and do all three pieces. So we opted to do the roof, which was most important at the time, um, to get the building um, secure uh, from uh, infiltration and to uh, put the uh, boilers in because we were having uh, some difficulties. We only had one operating boiler. There were four of them in the basement. Um, we don't move boilers. We just keep knocking them, putting them aside and uh, moving forward. So we do we now have a complete new heating plant, hot water um, and uh, uh, domestic water and, and uh, heating. And we uh, have a brand new, brand new five roofs on the, uh, on the building. So this is the next step, 390 windows. Um, and uh, again, there'll be some work around the windows. Uh, some of it will be covered within the scope of uh, the um, accelerated repair program. There may be uh, pieces of that project that won't be covered if um, it extends further than um, a certain uh, percentage of the uh, area in which the window sits. Uh, as, as the last uh, project, this is no, um, there's no monetary uh, tie uh, whatsoever with this. This is strictly a statement of interest, and if we get invited into the next round, then it becomes a feasibility study, and uh, the following round would be where the major dollars are. The $250, uh, $250,000 uh, dollar amount is the standard amount at which we do um, feasibility studies on, on accelerated repair programs. I get a motion and a second. So moved. I get a motion. Second. I get a motion and a second. Um, Ms. Larravee. <clears throat> Resolved, having convened <clears throat> an open meeting on February 14th, 2022, prior to the closing date, the school committee of the uh, city of Fall River, in accordance with its charter, bylaws, and ordinances, has voted to authorize the superintendent to, to submit to the Massachusetts School Building Authority the statement of interest form dated March 25th, 2022, for the Resiliency Preparatory Academy, located at 290 Rock Street, which describes and explains the following deficiencies and the priority categories for which an application may be submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority in future replacement, renovation, or modernization of school systems such as roofs, windows, boilers, heating and ventilation systems, to increase energy conservation and decrease energy related costs in a school facility. This project will be for a request of a complete window and door replacement and hereby further specifically acknowledges that by submitting the statement of interest form, the Massachusetts School Building Authority in no way guarantees the acceptance or the approval of an application, the awarding of a grant or any other funding commitment from the Massachusetts School Building Authority or commits the city, town, regional school district to filing an application for funding with the Massachusetts School Building Authority. Thank you, Ms. Larravee. Uh, Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. 11, 11 is a discussion and vote to approve a budget transfer as presented by Kevin Almeida, Chief Financial Officer. So in front of you, you have the uh, third budget transfer, the transfer for this year. Um, this transfer just being done to cover current shortfalls that we have. We are in good standing where we are. I provided you with the documentation explaining why we're over and under in those line items. So I'm requesting <coughs> approval from you today. Motion to approve. I have a motion to approve. Do I have second. a second? Do 
Do I have a second? Yeah. Oh, Sarah, I'm, I'm sorry. No, Shelly. No, Shelly. I, I second, yeah. yeah. I must be losing it. Go ahead, Mr. Hagee. <laughs> a question on not necessarily these transfers, but does this make all of the accounts projected to, you're not going to need any more transfers? Well, I mean, not. I, I will need more transfers. Just this is what I know of as of right now. So if we were to project out for the rest of the year, Mm -hmm. Do you know the accounts that need, and you might be able to just send this I, to us? I have a pretty good idea, yes. It, I would just like to ask that we get those. These seem straightforward, yep. but later on in the year, they're going to be larger. Yep. I'm guessing, so I'd rather so have that knowledge the, ahead of time, so it's not like we're, if the, we don't make the transfer, then we're in a negative. The only, the, only issue, the only issue with projecting now at this point with some items is that we're still in negotiations with certain unions, so um, some of the negotiations may cause further or larger increases than I anticipate. So. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I think you understand my point. Just yep. the, the sooner the better, so we're not in May or June doing them all. Absolutely. Thank you, I yield. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Aguia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Larvey? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Number 1112 is a discussion and vote to approve a year-to-date budget report as presented by Kevin Almeida, Chief Financial Officer. So this is our monthly monthly report for January. We're at uh, just under 54% spent to date in January. Um, we're in good standing here. Um, in addition, I just wanted to point out that the insurance um, is projecting almost at, you know, exactly what we budgeted. So. It's the numbers fluid, so it'll it'll go up and down throughout the rest of the year. But it's uh, we're pretty pretty close on the insurance side. So, any further discussions for um, Mr. Aguilar? I'm not sure if uh, we had received it yet, but the uh, isn't it in March when the numbers are going to actually be approved? Or where to see if the city owes us any additional funds? Is that already done? Uh, we so typically so typically it happens around like February vacation. The state still hasn't certified the end of the year report as of yet. We haven't received anything from them as of yet, but I do anticipate it, be, it shortly. And so that hasn't happened yet? No, we haven't received anything from the state yet. No. What, would it, what was it, uh, the draft of the... Uh, I don't have it in front of... In, <coughs> if you could just send us those... I, I, will, I will for Friday, I will. I'll send but it hasn't happened yet, so there's one more, like, no. million-dollar transfer that has to come from the so city. So the, 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 state, the state has... the state. In all the time that I've been here, the state usually certifies in January, in that January time frame. But over the last several years, it's been in February, closer to like February vacation. So I do anticipate knowing from them very, very shortly. If you could just send that to the whole committee through the superintendent, appreciate it. Thank Absolutely. you, Ariel. Yep. Anything further? Could I get a vote, please? Motion to approve. I have a motion and a second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Deb? Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Larrabee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes. Um, item number 12 is for your information. I have a number of retirements, resignations, appointments. Can I get a motion and a second? Motion to approve. Second. 12. Do you want to get 12.12? No, all of them. All at once. Uh, could I get, could I get a, a roll call on all of them, please, Deb? Mr. Agia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Laravi? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes. Item number 13, new business. Anybody have any new business to come before the committee? Hearing none. Um, is there an item number 14 is a request for executive session? Do we have a need to go into executive session? There would, uh, Mr. Chair. If you'd like, I could uh, recite those re reasons. Please. Mass General Lodge, Chapter 30A, Section 21A7, to review and approve executive session minutes for January 10, 2022, regular meeting of the school committee. Uh, Mass General Lodge, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all civil clerical employees of the Florida School System, represented by the Florida Department of Civil Service Clerical Employees Association, as the chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all paraprofessional employees of the Fall River School System, represented by the Fall River Federation of Paraprofessionals, as the chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation 
With regard to Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination Complaints, as the Chair has determined that a, an open session may have a detrimental impact on the litigation position of the Committee. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all professional teaching employees of the Florida school system, including coaches, Title I teachers, nurses, occupational and physical therapists, and specialists in the teaching profession represented by the Florida Educators Association, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining relative to all administrators and employees represented by the Florida Administrators Association, as the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the bargaining position of the committee. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to litigation uh, regarding Elenia Bernard versus Latino Elementary School, case number 19BEM00885. As the Chair has determined that an open session may have a detrimental impact on the litigating position of the committee. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A1, to review the open meeting law complaint dated uh, January 10, 2022, filed by Patrick Higgins regarding the January 10, 2022, regular school committee meeting. Mr. Higgins alleges that the meeting minutes were not accepted or adopted in a timely manner and that the Chair uh, did not list the name of individuals considered for subcommittee appointments in violation of the open meeting law. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A1, to review the open meeting law complaint, dated February 1, 2022, filed by Colin Dias, regarding the uh, January 18, 2022, certificate of receipt of open meeting law materials. Mr. Dias alleges a violation of open meeting law. Mr. Dias alleges that the mayor did not complete and certify his open meeting law certificate of receipt of open meeting law materials in a timely manner. Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A3, to conduct strategy. Sessions in preparation for negotiation with non-union personnel <coughs> and or to conduct negotiations with non-union personnel, including Maria Ponce, <coughs> interim superintendent of schools. The committee would reconvene. There may or may not be statements at that time. I'm looking for a motion and a second to go into executive session. Motion. Second. I have a motion and a second. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agnew? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Larrabee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Mr. Rodericks? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Steve. I'd like to call to order the meeting. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agnew? Here. Mr. Bailey? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Ms. Larravee? Here. Ms. Herrera? Here. Ms. Rodericks? Here. Mayor Coogan? Here. Uh, anything further to come before the committee? Yes. Uh, Yes, uh, we're going to make a motion to appoint Maria Pont, superintendent, through June 30th, 2022, pending negotiation, negotiations of, well, what is it? Of, of a successor. Oh, success of the contract. Okay. I have a motion. Second. second. I have a motion to second. Discussion. Deb, please call the roll. Mr. Agnew? Yes. The other Mr. One. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Harp? Yes. Ms. Larravee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Roderick? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Same also, motion to approve executive session minutes for January 10th, 2022. Second. I have a motion to second. Deb, please call the roll. Ms. Dragia? Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Larrabee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Roderick? Yes. Mayor Coogan? Yes. Anything further to come before the committee? Happy Valentine's Day. Happy, Happy Valentine's birthday, Happy Mayor birthday. Coogan. Mayor. Mayor. Happy birthday, Mayor. Okay. Uh, congratulations, <laughs> Superintendent Pont. And thank you. Sick of saying interim myself, so good luck. Thank you. Adjourn. Oh. I need a motion. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'm sorry, yes. I did it too fast. <laughs> motion to adjourn. Second. second. I have a motion second. To have a Mr. Call. Yes. Mr. Bailey? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. yes. Ms. Larrabee? Yes. Ms. Pereira? Yes. Ms. Rodericks? Yes. Mary Coogan? Yes.